Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, we're here for the March 27th uh, meeting of the Short Term Rental Special Committee, which is our third working session. Uh, and Catherine and I will presume that the notice went out uh, under FOIA, so we're good to go on that, correct? Yes. And uh, we shall now begin the meeting. So, um, this uh, today we have two principal things on the agenda. People have been doing research, asking some questions, uh, looking for data, and we're going to get a report on those and um, projects. See what more needs to be done. And second, we are going to. Uh, here from Susan Murray on uh, her analysis of the comments made to the portal. But, uh, and then after that, we can all uh, go around the table and give our reactions to the comments on the portal. There were many comments, over 450. So um, I don't know that every member of the committee has been able to complete their review of the comments yet, um, but I have, and so I have some reactions um, and anybody else who has reactions that they want to state what they've gleaned from the portal, uh, we'll do that after Susan gives her um, analysis. And then uh, finally, at the end, we're, go we're going to talk about scheduling for a little bit. Uh, we have one more meeting left of those that have been scheduled in the first batch, which is next uh, Wednesday. Um, and talk about what we want to do at that meeting. Uh, depending on what we learned today, I, I am inclined for the next meeting to start actually work on uh, some of the issues and the issues outline. I thought probably it might be best to start with something um, that there's fairly universal agreement on and in the comments and reactions that we've had, which is uh, enforcement and what, what should be on the book on the town of Seabrook Island and how we are going to enforce it. Um, but we can speak about that later. So uh, with that, why don't we get started? We'll just go down the row and see what people have been up to. So Deb? Well, I had two assignments. One was to contact all the COVID presidents and find out you know, if they had Cats, um, and I'll get into that in just a second. But my second assignment was <clears throat> contacting the club to get some statistics. And Lindsay Arnold is working on that. She's hoping to have something for me before our meeting next week. So as soon as I get that information from her, she's looking at like capacity and utilization. Um, so that I, I don't have anything further to report on today. But as far as the COVAR information is concerned, after talking to a lot of the presidents, um, and as we briefly mentioned in the last meeting, there were five, I'll just say regimes that have some type of a limitation. So the first one was Charlestown, and theirs was effective in April of 2023. And basically, they prohibited any further short term rentals. And there was one property that had a rental permit, and so they grandfathered them in. So it won't be until that property sold and then they will become 100% short-term rental prohibited. Their long-term rentals are six months or more. Then I have all over a point, and I haven't been able to get a hold of the president yet, so I don't know the effective date, but they also prohibit short-term rentals. Their long-term rental is a 30-day rental. Um, Horseshoe Code was effective. They actually had a cap back in 2006, 
and they revised it along the way. So I went the whole way up to the one that is in current um, effective was 2014. And in 2014, they basically reached the point where uh, short-term rentals were prohibited. And they there was none that had a permit at that time, so there was nothing for them to grandfather in. Marsh Point, I haven't gotten an effective date yet from the president, but they also prohibit short-term rentals. Their long-term rental is a 90 day minimum. And lastly, of the five, is Salt Marsh. Their effective was September of 2023. They are short-term rental prohibited, but they had three properties that had short-term rental permits. So they did grandfather them in until they're sold. Their long-term rental minimum is three months. So in addition to this, I also called Tom Beck at the um, broker in charge of Seabrook Island, and he, I gave sure. him. Okay. The Marsh Point, did you, did you give us a date on that? But it was back to September of 2023. Um, so Tom said none of his agents have voiced any issues on these five regimes as far as sales are concerned. Um, a couple of them are small, but some of them are pretty large. Um, Salt Marsh has Salt Marsh has 53 units, so that's a fairly large neighborhood. Um, Marsh Point has 26 units with zero short-term rentals in them. Um, Horseshoe Cove has 12 units, so they're fairly small. Uh, Hollow Point only has five units, and Charlestown has 16 units with the um, property grandfathered in. And then Tom, Beck, as I mentioned, the, the broker, I gave him the information. He said he hasn't had any of the agents um, stating that they've had any issues selling any of the properties in these regions. Do you have any questions? I'm not going to go over all of it. You, I think you guys get a spreadsheet or Catherine probably posted it to the portal, but did send a spreadsheet. I am still working on it to get the effective date for those two regimes. And then I have two properties that I haven't been able to contact the president. I see they have short-term rental permits, so I'm assuming they don't have any kind of a cap, but I'll keep them trying to get a hold of them. So if I finally get the pieces of the puzzle, I'll send a revised version, but that's what I have so far. Thank you. And Ken, I don't want to jump ahead, but <clears throat> do I? Were you working um, with Deb about sales history at, at those places? Or I know you're looking at property values, but were you specifically looking at the sales history post? I gave him the five regimes last meeting, but that's all I had so far. So I I have looked into some real estate sale documentation. Okay. Yeah, one, I mean, Deb, you're included. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention uh, but forgot is that last week, uh, Joe and Catherine gave us a lot of very, very helpful information, which was supplemented this morning with the additional column of uh, full-time residences. So, so the spreadsheet that they gave us last week, but with additional column, Based on the on the tax rating of the property, so um, after we go through this, um, I have some reactions to that, and anybody else who has reactions to the data that uh, Joe and Catherine gave us last week, um, we, should, we should talk about that. Yeah, I, I had a summary um, relating to that. <clears throat> so both. The uh, Sapoa and the town have 1,340 properties that are within the regimes and associations. And of those, there's a round, and I think Sapoa and the town vary a little bit, but Joe, the town I think was around 336, the same as Sapoa. 336, 337 full time properties. There was 541 that were part-time, but they don't rent their properties. And as we all know, there's 463 that are short-term rental properties. So basically, the full-time and the part-times that don't rent is 877 and 1,340. And I did have some of it, just to mention in the spreadsheet, I did have some presidents that said, well, we're talking about it. 
we didn't vote on it yet, but now we're kind of wanting to see the outcome of the committee in the town. So, but there were others that were, were thinking about that. That's in the report. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask one quick question about Charlestown specifically? They did theirs kind of in a really odd manner. Um, because when you when you do that type of restriction, you have to amend your covenants, um, covenants and it has to be recorded. So when they did theirs, they, they said you couldn't have a new short-term rental, but they only exempted one property. And, I and, see it went in, two. and it went into effect as of a specific date. And what happened was the second property came in before that took effect. So we have two, That's but right. their covenants say only that one that had one could have a permit. So how did you get an indication from them? How they're no, I that saw that because I looked at your records after I talked to the president and I thought, oh, you have two permits and they're only grandfathering one in. So I said they didn't send us the notification. Well, it wasn't recorded, I yeah. think, until after. Well, my understanding month. is you yeah. don't have to record it until one year later. So they did have a year to, for the covenants to actually be uh, filed with the county. Uh, so the effective dates that I was giving you was when they approved it, the board and the owners voted on it. So I'm giving you the dates that the owners approved it and not not necessarily the date that the covenants were filed at the county. Because that's when they wanted it basically to, to kick in when they approved it and it was voted as approved. But that would be if, if their position is only one is legal, then that's something that they would have to enforce as a regime on that second I mean I can call the president but I think they're kind of like they're, they're gonna deal with it I guess yeah. when it gets sold and just kind of sit back and let it go but they only documented when following it um my task was to take a look at the information that was submitted by uh, Susan McLaughlin. I'll start with that first. Um, Isla Palms has a population of 4,347 people, and there are currently 1,672 approved permitted STRs. Uh, the proposed cap that came up for a vote and was defeated was to limit the STRs to 1,600 STRs, so to take it from 1,672 down to 1,600. And that cap was narrowly defeated in 2023 by 5.4% of the uh, eligible voters. Um, STRs are limited to the, to the greater of the following, either two people per bedroom plus two people, or, or one person per 250 square feet of gross heated floor space or six people. No property may exceed 12 people. Overnight parking is limited to one vehicle per approved bedroom and a vehicle for every 2.5 people allowed under the maximum overnight occupancy. Parking is a major issue, according to the people I spoke to at IMP. Regarding current, I have a little information. I'm still getting more as it flows in. Current sales from January 1st, 2024 to February 29th, 2024. Um, one bedroom sales were up 4.8%. Two bedroom sales were up 4.5%. Three bedroom sales were down 11.7%. Four bedrooms were down 2.5%. Five bedrooms were up 3%. A total of nine units were sold and the uh, median price was up 0.9%, and that is for IOP. Uh, Folly Beach, their population is 2,056 people. Uh, a cap was recently imposed, taking STRs from 1,200, which existed, down to 800. And it will take years to bring the number down by owners not renewing their rental licenses, or by the sale of properties. There was a recent judgment handed down on March 7th, 2024, in support of the town of Folly Beach refer referendum to impose this cap. So basically what's going to happen is, is that it's, it's going to 
take some time to filter through to get it down to that 800 uh, number that, that the uh, town has now imposed. Um, sales, very interesting. Um, one bedrooms are down 36.2%. You talking about prices. What's that? Prices. You talking about volume or prices? Volume. Volume sales, yeah. Not the price. Not the price. Okay, got it. Uh, bedrooms are down, uh, uh, two bedrooms are up 11.4%, three bedrooms are up 1%, four bedrooms are down 36.8%, and five bedrooms are up 11%. And the median sale price is overall down 4.8%. And that's, again, this is only data for the first two months of 2024. What I'm looking into right now in, in uh, compiling is... 2019, 20, 21, and 22, and 23 sales to take a look at basically where the real estate market has gone in those communities. And that'll give us kind of a barometer as to the, the rolling football, as we speak. Um, Mount Pleasant's really interesting. They have a population of 92,398, and they have a maximum which they have just capped at 400 STRs. And there is currently a waiting list of 260 applications for STRs in the town of Mount Pleasant. And STRs are limited to two guests per bedroom plus two additional guests per rental unit. Each rental unit requires designated off-street parking for each vehicle. No on-street parking is allowed at all and is subject to fines or loss of the permit. The real estate data that I got from Mount Pleasant uh, had conflicting issues. So I am, before I submit that, I want to confirm some, some numbers that would be a little bit uh, more correct, I guess. Um, and the so how many people did you say Mount Pleasant? Okay. There are ninety two thousand three hundred and ninety eight people. Um, and this was an overall cap of four hundred, not uh, specified as service only districts, but just for the for the city as a whole. For the city as a whole. Yeah, they did not do it via zones or residents, you know, they just said overall 400 unit cap and that was it. And that was just recently done in 2023. Um, Sullivan's Island population is 1880, 1880. There are no STRs allowed uh, on Sullivan's Island and a rental must be a minimum of 30 days or longer. Um, in 2023, the Board of Zoning Appeals banned any and all fractional ownership arrangements that had been or future to be on the island. Um, that was kind of an interesting- That had been? Uh, no, that moving forward. Oh, okay, yeah. Moving forward. That's kind of an interesting scenario because mm -hmm. We're faced with a little bit of those situations, not a lot, but a little bit on, on our island. And, and that's something that we should definitely take into consideration when we are um, reviewing all of this. It's, it's fractional. Yeah. And, uh, but, however, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we would, if, if it's within a family, that's one thing. But if it's within a corporation, I think it's a, a, a something that we need to look at. Right. And I'm just going to add uh, that in uh, 2023, um, <clears throat> at the annual meeting, suppose, <clears throat> um, passed a covenant amendment that deals with fractional interest, which is not to say that we shouldn't, but, but that, that in beyond the gates because the town does it through prohibit. But um, beyond the gates, the um, there is something on, on supposed books for actual interest and also uh, just for anyone watching so that 
there's no confusion. Um, it is harder to define. Uh, we all know what we're talking about, but it's a little harder to define. But when you say corporate, you're talking about like real corporate as opposed to family LLCs that are formed for the benefit of taxes and um, whatever reason to buy a house or an LLC. Uh, we all know what you're talking about, but for the benefit of anybody who's watching, we're not talking about um, uh, dealing with families who, who, who purchase a uh, house through an LLC. Um, regarding real estate values on Sullivan's Island, again, I'm getting some uh, conflicting information, so I am still compiling that as well. Uh, Kilo Island, population of 1,966. SDRs may not exceed 20% of the total number of properties in specific residential areas. That's the part I'm having a tough time getting information as to how they determine which, how they determine those residential areas. And I think that I have finally gotten to the right person that I need to, to clarify that. Um, uh, limits to guests are two per legal bedroom plus two guests maximum per unit. And uh, communities such as Cacique and the Kiwa Club do not allow any rentals of any kind, whether it's long-term or short-term rentals in, in those properties. For Kiwa, isn't it 20% in zone one, 40% in zone two, and none for the villas? That that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to get a definite handle on. Yeah. Yeah, Nancy. It's 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 kind of like a movie target. Yeah, that's what it's it's not 20% of all the properties. So Correct. It's a big difference. Yeah. I thought it, I, I thought it, and it would, I could be wrong about this. Yeah. I thought I read it was 20% and it's only gone into 40%. Unless they changed it. Unless they changed it. Yeah. But that's how I read it. Yeah, that was but. that was the problem that I was having was just that it, it seemed to be I couldn't get a, a, a definitive answer on that. It, since they originally passed it, it's always been 20% zone one, 40% zone two, none on Phillips. Okay. Right. If they change it, it's been in the last year. Um, I think there was, from the chart from the Municipal Association, I thought there was a change in uh, 2023, but, um, okay. but, but we can nail that down. Yeah. That, that's nail that down. Um, current sales. One bedrooms are up 6.6%, two bedrooms are up 1.9%, three bedrooms are down 20.1%, four bedrooms are down 11%, and five bedrooms are down 1%. And the median price uh, overall on Kiowa is right now currently down 14.7%, which is just pretty hefty. But um, one of the other things I looked at, I still, I'm trying to get more information from, du I think it's called Dupree. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. Um, and I'm working with their property management, their HOA company out of Charleston. And they're supposed to get back to me on um, Thursday, which is manana. Um, Seabrook Island population, 1904, currently has no cap in place by the town, currently regimes within Seabrook Island uh, with no STR or some cap are, as Deb stated, the Horseshoe Cove, Charleston Place, Salt Marsh, Hallover, and Marsh Point. The information she gave us today is all good information. Current sales, we have one bedrooms are down 3.5%, two bedrooms are down 1.9%, three bedrooms are up 12%, four bedrooms are up 8.5%, Five bedrooms are up 79.4%. And there have been a total of 18 units sold in that two month period. And the median price is up 8.4%. How many five bedrooms were sold? I'm just curious. Um, that can skew it. Yes. I mean, yeah, that would, that would definitely skew it for sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't bring that information, okay. but I can get that for okay. sure. Yeah. 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 Those, those big ones. Um, that's pretty much so what I have so far. Okay. Ted, um, is it going to be possible for you to put those in the written form that we can 
Yes, there also it's it's an it's in a word format right now. Okay. And I can send it over to Cassie. Okay. Um yeah, and if there's any sales history and I and I know Deb talked about talking with the, the broker in charge uh, concerning those regimes that don't happen, but if there's any sales history sort of before and after, that would be helpful. I mean there's some of them are so small that, but some of them, yeah, some have enough units that that there could be a little bit of a sales history that might be interesting. Um, so the two of you work together on that, and, and so Chad, if you can, well, yep. right, and also, um, if possible, getting to Nancy's point, where where it's feasible to put in the actual. Numbers, you know, because if you go from one house to two house, that's a hundred percent. So the median, but the median sale price of a one one through five bedroom. Nancy, is that what? <laughs> no, I just meant like when you were giving percentages. Well, how many? Like, like. Oh, the breakdown. Of how many? How many properties were in each category? Is what I was thinking. Yeah, about. gotcha. Okay, so some of them. It's just hard to. Look at a percentage. Yeah, yeah, those two to three will skew the yeah, right. numbers big time. Yeah, and and also, um, yeah, if there's if there's any uh, breakdown in terms of price uh, fluctuations, broken down by the units by the size by the size. Um, again, I don't want to. Um, overburden you with this, but the more specific information we have in writing, uh, the better. Gotcha. Thank you. Isn't there a complexity to this, though, that like the insurance rates going up? There's other factors that you need to play. Ali and I were talking about this before the meeting, where some of the regimes are getting nailed big time on insurance, and that's coming into play why their sales aren't exactly booming compared to I had a summer when it sold in two days. So, and that's where they they pay your individual. Yeah, it's very difficult to right. sell a high hammock right now right. because okay. their large deductible mortgage companies won't lend money. And Pelican watches went up also. So, I mean, we don't want to just go on the numbers. And, no, no, no. Yeah, as I, I say, there's a complexity to this that's influencing. Yeah, that. well. <laughs> Without a doubt in the world, it's we all know that correlation doesn't equal causation, and it and that's even double when you're dealing with small numbers and small units of time. So if you had something over a you know ten year period where five years prior to caps and five years after caps and you have 300 sales or something that you might be able to even, mm -hmm. it's still not causation because the other factor could be insurance or storms or this or that, but you, but it'd be better um, data. And this is very limited data and therefore um, each of us can do with it what we want, but I'm certainly not going to um, assume that because there were these fluctuations um, that that definitely proved something one way or the other. I just thought, just, in the matrix. I just thought if anyone's listening or watching, I just wanted to throw that in so because next door is going out of control that they don't just jump on just what Ted said and not take other factors into consideration. Right. So before it gets all wild, I just wanted to point out that this is a complex situation, not just to take that. Right, it's also an election year, interest rate. I mean, lots of things. Yeah, a absolutely. I, I agree a thousand percent with that, and I appreciate bringing that up. But uh, Ali, to follow up, just for my information, what? So, big, so at, at high hammock mortgage companies or yeah, they're they. You know, everybody's aware of the high hammock uh, HOA went through the roof, primarily driven by wind insurance. So there was a big push last year. What can we do to hold that HOA down? So one of the things they did is they went from a 5% deductible to a 10 and as a 10% reductible on very old villas, which high hammocks are pretty old. A lot of mortgage companies now are, are treating those properties as unwarrantable, which means it's, they're, they're, they're not lending money. 
So you can still, there are some companies that still do. They come with a larger down payment than traditionally you would have to come up with and typically a higher interest rate. So it's become very difficult now to sell high hammock uh, villas unless you're willing to drastically reduce your price or you have a cash buyer. And, 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 the, and the regime is going to review their insurance decision. I think it's due in August or September. So they're going to review that to see, does it make sense to stay at a 10% deductible or go back to a five, which would then come with a higher monthly premium for each way. And their premium went from 495 to 650 to 13.50. And my understanding was if they left it at five percent deductible, it would have been about fourteen seventy. Okay, just to, um, so um, so I think everybody at the time thought it was a really good move to go to the five the higher deductible, but they didn't. There was an unintended consequence. They didn't realize it was going to be now more difficult to actually sell the units. That, because that jump from five to ten percent yeah. made it made the mortgage companies. Yes, yeah, they're treating it at a, a different risk factor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, this is very complicated. Um, I mean, there there are many factors. Yeah. Um, it, so thank you, uh, Nancy. Um, Tracy and I were um, submitted several questions to Sapoa. I called yesterday to find out, um, you know, where we stood with that, and um, I was told by Sapoa that they're still working on it. Tracy, did you get anything back? No, I haven't heard anything from Sapoa. Um, so I mean, we kind of have a hot button issue looking at traffic figures and incident reports and that type of thing. Um, so the only thing that I did take the time to do, and is what we have available through the um, our SAPOA portal are those safety and security meeting minutes that are posted for everybody to look at. Um, so I took some time and looked at, for example, the. it would be nice to have the raw data from SAPOA so that we can look at it and make our own chart. That missing, um, when you look at the, just so the committee knows, when you look at the traffic citations, you know, SAPOA does break them down, owners, renters, contractors, employees. Um, but for 2023, just so everybody knows, um, SAPOA has two different categories. One is visitors and one is renters. I'm not quite sure without further information from SAPOA what a visitor is versus a renter. Um, in my mind, they can be the same, not necessarily a guest of a homeowner or a club member. It could be, what if I'm the named person on a rental contract, but I'm driving the car that gets pulled over? Does my citation get listed as a visitor versus a renter? Um, so that kind of muddies that category for me. But when you look at their 2023 minutes um, on the SAPOA website for traffic violations, um, to get the visitor number was 70 issued. No, I'm sorry. The visitor number was 111 issued. The renters were 70 for the year. But if you total them together, it's 181. Owners were 183 and contractors were 182. Um, and they had 15 employee citations for the year. Um, so that's traffic data from the SAPOA website that we can see, not the raw data. Um, and there are two months where they don't have data available, whether they didn't get it from their vendor or what the reason is, Nancy and I don't know yet because um, we haven't heard from them, but there are July, which is the busiest month of the year, that data is missing. And I think February. So this is 10 months worth of data from their safety and security meeting minutes. Um, and then the other thing, um, that we're all also tasked with, you know, nuisance. And I know Ollie and I, Ollie's started to work on this. Um, SAPOA reports monthly incident reports. Um, so one of a lot of questions Nancy and I had asked were for data, more backup for these incident reports. I'm assuming a lot of them pertain to nuisance. Um, so I took some time to look at the 10 months of data again for incident reports. Um, 
and there were 214 for the 10 months that are up on the SAPOA website for incidents for the year. Lots of categories um, and without the raw data, it's hard to know. They're not broken down into rental versus owner, like the traffic citations. So that was one of the questions we had, which we don't have an answer to. So, you know, there were three disturbance um, incident reports, 15 property damage reports for, for the 10 months. You know, there are a lot of things that we don't have the data for yet that hopefully we'll get later on and have a more complete report from Sapoa on some of these figures um, to back up. You know, people say, know yes, yes, traffic's increased or... I know the property damage, a lot of those are mailboxes from okay. Sapoa because Sapoa fixes those, so yeah. Gotcha, okay. Um, so that's all I, I have on, on that. I think Nancy and I will be able to put something together if we get some raw data, which we don't have yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I do... Uh, so what I heard this week is, and I, so just to let you know, Tracy, I, we, Catherine had heard from uh, Heather that could we pare back some of the questions uh, It would require a lot of staff time to answer, et cetera. And I requested that Catherine convey to Heather that um, they should just, provide whatever information they're going to provide. And if they don't want to, because it would be too much staff time or, or whatever the case, just tell us. But okay. rather than us trying to anticipate what they would have a problem with, um, they can just tell us. And um, you know, ultimately, that's going to be it. Um, this is not a congressional com committee. We do not have subpoena power. <laughs> we sure. You're not going to get the uh, Justice Department to uh, to try to pursue this. Um, we are asking as cooperative uh, a part of our tripartite governing system here. And to the extent that we get uh, cooperation from uh, Sapoa at the club, um, that's terrific. People want that uh, to the extent that we basically can only get what is already available on the website then uh, that's their choice and we we can't do anything about it other than request the information which you and Nancy have done so thank you for that. Yep I totally agree um, a lot of the public comments I feel like that we heard from people who rent are that their renters have never been a problem um, and I know from my experience that's not quite true and so um, in an answer in a vein to answer some of those accusations, um, it would be nice to have data to say, well, this is actually what's happening, but I totally agree with you. SAPOA does not have to share their information. Um, and that's just what's on their website for right now. And then we'll talk a little, I, I at least and anybody else will talk more about the reactions uh, to um, the comments uh, in a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alex. Um, I also spent a little bit of time worrying about, worrying is not the right word, but looking at the need for uh, enforcing uh, certain rules or behaviors. Um, I found myself a little bit spinning the wheels and trying to type it out. I think I sent to some of you what I my, where my brain was heading. It, it it just seems to me almost like common sense. So I don't think we're going to have a hard time coming up with what we need to keep track of at, at all. Um, I, I think um, and again this is more was my reaction to last week is and this is going towards how the enforcement conversation which maybe is better for next week but i'll share just a little bit of where my head is yeah, is uh sapoa has their arms around what they want to enforce i think the town does a good job of what they want to enforce but 
I'm not, I, I still have this sense, and again, it's, it's not scientific by any means, nor is it trying to intend to speak on any of how you guys all feel, is that I still think the residents are, are confused of what to report, how to report, when to report. And, and I think the, we can define the rules that we need or what we need to keep track of fairly easily, but how we're going to enforce it is going to be a challenge. It, 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 again, this is 100% just my view, is that I still think that SAPOA, and again, after what we just got done talking about, I'm not sure this is possible, but I think somehow SAPOA and the town needs to come together. I think a single uh, way to report instances is, is needed that you would, again, if the, if the town has a great portal or database to report instances, I don't understand why SAPOA can't use the same system. I think there's, there's, there's an opportunity. Again, I don't know how hard it would be to do this, but if you had a cooperation agreement between the two enforcement areas where like during the day, the city has full-time staff going up and down the streets doing enforcement, they're prepared to do that. But at night, we have people off island that maybe can come that maybe security needs to be doing the after hours stuff and vice versa, that they could actually be have the ability to help with each other's enforcement. That just makes sense to me. I'm sure the people of Sapo and the people of the town are going to tell me why that doesn't work or can't work, but it just smells like if you had a single place to report and a single way to enforce, then you could do some education with the with the with the all the residents of here's what you do. Well, right now, I think it's just confusing to people and they just throw up their hands and their reaction is, even though they've been told, I'm not saying the groups aren't telling people, my sense is they're throwing their hands up and saying, I don't know what to do. And they just grouse about whatever it is that's making them unhappy and they have no way to report to get action. And to me, I think a lot of the issues that we're dealing with on this front would go away if there was a, a place to go to and action was was timely. I mean, it does no good for somebody to show up the morning after there's there's been a, a party at midnight. The next morning, the, the person who won't complain is, is unhappy, and the people who were making the noise are probably still sleeping. I mean, that's... So, <laughs> it, it, and I, I think we, we got to figure out how to get around that. I mean, defining the rule that we don't want the noise at midnight is easy. How are we going to enforce it and how to make people comfortable that there's action being taken and they can be confident that action is going to be taken, I think is where we got to focus our attention on, is on, on the enforcement side. I think we can do the rules in about 20 minutes. We well, do have a noise ordinance first, though, right? No, we need it. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 clearly. Yeah. And I think, you know, and, and, and I didn't say it up front because I kind of focused on what do I think behaviors we should need to worry about for the short term rental community. It, in the end, it should be for everybody. Right. There's not, it's not, these people can be noisy and these people can. It's it's, it's, right. it's all one rule, but because we're the STR committee, I only really focus on things that I thought, okay, I really about short-term rentals, but there, there could be rules out there that maybe a permanent resident needs to worry about that short-term rental does it. So I, I really wasn't worried about those at all. But right. in the end, I think you're going to have... I would think you'd have a single ordinance that would say, here's how you behave on the side, yeah. no matter what you are, visitor, non-visitor, guest, renter, permanent, I, I don't really care. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that. I mean, that applies as well to the parking issues and, and, yep. it, and it applies to the garbage issues. Um, speaking of garbage, uh, by the way, I um, attended, a, a extremely well attended, uh, town event this week by Gordon Weiss, led by Gordon Weiss, and on coyotes on the island. Uh, it was uh, literally standing room only at the lake house. And um, uh, this should come as no surprise to anybody, but uh, coyotes like uh, garbage on the ground. And actually, Rodents like garbage lying on the ground, and coyotes like rodents who like to <laughs> garbage lying on the ground. So, to some extent, what we're talking about is, you know, to some people, sounds like 
I don't know, petty if this is the right word, trivial, like, oh, these people, they, what, they don't have anything better to worry about than, than the garbage cans and stuff. But um, I, um, I think in this environment, um, not having the sorts of things, some things we've read about in the comments, in terms of food and stuff lying around is actually really important. Um, one homeowner reported uh, seeing uh, a pack of seven coyotes walking on it through a side yard. If I saw uh, seven coyotes in my side yard, I'm not sure what I would do, but that would be. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, um, in any event, th these things these things are important. The only thing I would add, Ali, is that we'll have to deal with and we'll have to think about is that the the bio the restrictions, the violations may be the same for everybody, but the but the penalties may be a little bit different because if there's a um, pattern of violations. At a full-time resident's house, you can't suspend that resident from living in the house. You can you can have fines. You can have increasing fines. <clears throat> but uh, one of the things that a lot of locations do, you kind of read about, is that if there's violations repeatedly at a at a rental house, then you can suspend the short-term rental license. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say this again. This may be more for next week, but I do think I I I'd be pretty supportive of. And again, I'm going to use the words three strikes in your app, but it doesn't have necessarily need to have be specific. But I think you know you, you should be given a chance to correct what the issue is. But if you can't get it fixed, then again, lack of better words, the hammer needs to come down in some in some fashion. Right. And uh, you're right. It, it, it's it's probably a different size hammer whether I'm a permanent full time resident or I'm a hundred percent rental property. I, I think that. Makes sense. Right. Different different hammers, but yes. uh, the same, the same nail. The um and that and again, I'm just saying this now for us to think about when we talk about this more mm -hmm. thoroughly. Um I know that both Sapoa and and the town and the enforcement officers have been sort of um thinking that if you go to someone uh, that's having a party and they're cooperative and they shut it down, you don't issue a uh, citation uh, because they were cooperative, they took, they, they dealt with it within two hours, et cetera. And that sounds good. And I'm not saying they should be fine, but unless that's actually reported and reported and given a warning or something to that effect, the problem is when you're dealing with short-term rentals is that the neighbor next door, um, so from the perspective of the renter, like, oh, okay, I got a warning, I won't do it again. And uh, so I'm a one-time offender and that's it. And then the next one comes in and I'm a one-time offender and that's it. And then the next one comes in, I'm a one-time but from the neighbor's perspective, it's a weekly occurrence. Yeah. So I think these things have to be done more with the house um, and with the property. And the other thing I sort of thought about is that yesterday in our town council meeting, we heard from the beach patrol and about all the citations. They, not citations, but the incidents that they report. And so for example, dogs off leash, they, they actually report on their records every time they have to tell somebody it's now 10 o'clock, the dog has to be unleashed. Not, they're not fining them or anything like that, but they're just, th th that sort of data is important to know. And likewise here, even if a warning is given, um, it should still be reported against, in my view, against that property. We do. Okay, so I'm not, Sure, it's a poet does, but yeah. for you, but for the town, if we we log every the, the table that was given to you all last week, okay. you know how like 
90 some percent was from internal complaints as Mike logging everything that he encounters and anything that our evening code enforcement staff encounters when we're not here, we then log the next day. Okay. And then, um, so that's very helpful. And then you could, I mean, theoretically, if it's written up into the ordinance, you could actually issue like a warning too, so that the, so he may tell them that, but I mean, in terms of, do you have any system of like telling a renter, you've now done this, here's a piece of paper that says you're, you're warned and pass this on to, um, no, there's not a written citation. Okay. Because written, it will, written but do you know which houses it was? Like when Mike has a problem, does he when he writes down trash can or whatever noise or whatever, is it recorded with that house so you know which properties are problems? It's tied to the it? address, but That's it's it. not like when we go and log it and it's the fourth one that a big you know right. But warning, you can this pull it up fourth, house. You know, this is the okay. fourth strike. But it, I mean, we're a extremely small operation. If Mike is repeatedly going to the same property, Mike knows that he's repeatedly going to that okay. same property. If we wanted to collect data on if certain properties were uh, problem properties, mm -hmm. we could do that with the information that we currently have. Okay. They, they also have the ability when they're going in to enter one, if they think it could be a multiple offender situation, um, the these are basically all, they're being entered into a portal, but it's also a searchable database. So they can go in on the backside, of, I'll just use Town Hall 2001, Seabrook Island Road. Um, before they decide what action um, they want to take, they can just enter 2001 and it's going to pop up every incident, issue, violation that's taken place um, at 2001 Seabrook Island. Yeah, that's very helpful. I mean, I think, one of the things I'm thinking about, and just throw it out as for us to think about, is that if if there's a a three strike thing, and and even there, I would you know think that it might have to be tailored to different levels of severity. Uh, I mean, three parties that are one o'clock in the morning, and I could see being a three strike, but three times and not bringing the garbage in could be a and a, a, a fine or, or some penalty, but not suspension of the license. But in any event, none of that would be fair to the property owner unless the property owner knew of it. So like, and you can't do that unless you actually say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna issue a warning or whatever the phrase would be. So it's no penalty this time, but, but it, there's gotta be some way to, for the property owner to know that or else the property owner can't do whatever the property owner is going to do to um, to try to. Yeah, I mean, I, I had an example just to kind of hit the nail on the head here that my assessment, annual Sapolo assessment was $50 larger than I thought it was going to be. And it was from a guest I had nine months ago who had a violation. It was a $50 fine. The guest drove off the island, didn't pay the fine, so I got assessed for it, and it, which is fine. But I, I made the point it did no good to tell me nine months after the fact mm -hmm. right. that, that I had a guest that didn't do anything. Right. If they'd done it immediately, I could have reached out to that guest. I either would got them to pay it, or at least would have been involved at, at nine months plus. No, it, it's a waste of time. So. Again, did you get a notification? Like I, I did not. Oh, okay. I did not. It just okay. showed up. As, it didn't even tell me what it was. It just says, "Here's your assessment. It's thirty one hundred dollars." And I could, gee, I thought they were thirty fifty. And and they explained to me that happened. So, you know, it, and I feel for you guys who are trying to. We have small staffs everywhere. So, but we got to figure out a way. You know, it's going to do no good to have an ordinance on rules. If we're not going to figure out how to enforce it, so we're going to have to figure that out. And and, and mo the owners I know would want to get involved to, to get the situation corrected. But if they don't know, they don't know. Yeah. And we got. To, and I don't. Want, I don't know what the answer is. But because I'm not suggesting we hire hundred people, but it sounds like we're going to have to do something either through databases, smarter databases that spit out this stuff, or 
more people who are going to analyze the data to know what's going on. No, I, I agree. And I mean, at the very, but at the, at the very least, we need to let the owners of properties know that somebody's had the thing because otherwise they can't they can't correct. And that's and then when an issue comes up in a short term rental, we direct that to the twenty four hour emergency contact who is acting on behalf of the owner. Um, that's so. That's I mean, what what occurs from there to relaying that information to the owner? I can't speak yeah. to that, but I mean our procedure is specifically to reach out to that designated contact for the property. Um, if they don't get that contact, then doesn't relay what's occurred to the owner. I can't I can't speak yeah. to that, but we we don't just log it and then go on. We also log it, take action, which is reaching out to that 24 hour emergency contact. Yeah, I actually know, but what's the rule for the 24 hour contact? How close do they need to be? 50 miles. All right, so, uh, so I think you, we need to take a hard look at that one too. I think it needs, my, my gut is that's too far because that'll find out the 24 hour contact if they're 50 miles away. But well, I think we also need, and this was got some something on it, just keep it, um, make sure that, uh, do, the, do those contacts have to sign a paper acknowledging that they know that they're the contacts and what yeah. their responsibility is? No, they do not actually, because that came up as a issue in previous years where we would reach out to a 24 hour emergency contact and it would be, you know, Susie the cleaner who's like, right. yeah, I yeah. cleaned that place uh, on Sunday. Right. Said, no, I'm not. The... Yeah. As an aside, I we agreed, my wife and I agreed to be a contact for somebody and we got, and we got, they reached out to us and we go, who would, why are you calling us? <laughs> and finally, we realized we were the contact. So, yeah. yeah. So, we need to, that is something to look at. But do you, so if you go and there's um, too many cars parked or the garbage is left out, because that's something we check. I mean, I know that's in SAPOA's rules, but that's also in our rules too, right? So, no, number, um, number of cars is not. But Wait, parking. Where, but where, where are they? Parking? Where are they parked? Okay. But one of those things. So you like Mike doesn't go to the door and say, "Hey, move your cars." He he caused the he caused the contact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. It's probably okay, but the contacts got to be reasonably close to do something. Well, a lot of the time it's just the contact thing calling the renter because they have that information and saying, we just were yeah. contacted by town code enforcement. Could you please get this moved within the next yeah. hour? The um, renters in downtown and, Charleston and then, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's all situation. Right. You know. all right. Oh, thank you. Okay, anything else, Alan? No. Uh, I wish I could figure out how to gather data to help this. This doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like a data issue to me. This feels more well. Like I think one of the things that I've looked at is just what other communities are doing, what's in their rules, and um, and I think it's giving me some ideas of um, a, a few little things on the margin that we may not have thought of. But one of the things that has been um, helpful to me is that it's reinforced that a lot of things that we're concerned about are the things that are. Yep. Um, and we don't have to go very far uh, to find sort of tighter enforcement of these sorts of things by the town, because I think Kiowa tightened this up a couple years ago um, in their ordinance. And it's the same you know, sorts of things that we are right. looking at. So in that, in that sense, it's helpful to, to reinforce that. Okay. So Susan, we're going to get to you in just a second on, on the, um, just kick off about the comments, but part of the other part of this in terms of the data and everything was to discuss the data that uh, Joe and Catherine circulated and anybody else after me, um, but I, I just want to know a couple of things. Um, and really, it's it's that 
Um, and this is not, we'll save for another day where, where this goes um, in terms of what, what we want to recommend. But the, the one thing that did strike me is that it, so when you're looking at the overall growth in short-term rentals, there's there's been this um, idea that, that it's always hovered in the twenty to twenty-five percent range, um, and sort of it sort of fluctuates in, in that range. And I, I think when you look at the data. You can see that there's been incremental growth. That the biggest jump certainly was during COVID, but um, it, it it hasn't gone back to pre-COVID levels. And the one really one thing I want to say is basically a simple arithmetic point. And I'm no math a scholar, so. There may be others on this committee or out there who have PhDs in math. And but I think this is pretty basic, which is some people get confused the difference when you talk about if something goes up from 22% to 25%, it, it goes up three percentage points. And that sounds like a lot, a little. That sounds like not not very much at all. But if something goes up from 22% to 25%, it's it's actually going up 14% because it, it's the 22% is of the overall number, the 25% is of the overall number, but the increase of 3% over the base of 22% is a 14% increase. So that's the total numbers that have gone up from pre-COVID to now. Um, the villas have gone up from 31% to 35.8%, which is a 15% increase. Again, it sounds like it's a 4% increase, but it's really a 15% increase. And the single family homes have gone up from 10.7% to 12% which is a 10.8% increase. So um, we'll talk at, in the future about what we make of that and whether we make, whether we, that means uh, anything uh, to any of us um, in terms of the issues that we'll be discussing. But right now, I just wanted to mention that I do think that there is a steady incremental growth of a of an amount that um, it, it is a bit more than. But well, we're than, still at twenty. We're at twenty four percent total. Right. Okay. So I mean, we have stayed under the twenty five percent. Right. No, okay. I'm not saying. That, okay. I, okay. So I'm not I saying. Guess I missed I'm not. Here. Okay. I'm not saying that. To say that we've gone between, we're within a twenty to twenty-five percent window, is not correct. What I'm saying is, it's sort of been a slow, steady progress up. It's not like jumps from twenty-one to twenty-three to twenty to twenty-four to twenty-two. It, it is. It is a steady growth, and if. It's simply the observation that if something goes from 22% to 25%, that's, it's not a 3% increase, it's a 14% increase. And again, that, you could take that and say, okay, but it's just 25% and it's, it's what we said. And I, that doesn't, um, that to me is not significant, but um, others, 
others may think it is more significant. So we'll talk about that later, but I, I just wanted to say it is that, that the data uh, was interesting, uh, very interesting to me, because it does uh, illustrate the sort of the slow, steady, incremental uh, interest. So does anybody else want to talk about the data that Joe Castle decided? Can, can I qualify one thing about the data? Um, these are based on the number of permits that were issued. So this is not necessarily a reflection of how many properties are actually being rented. Um, the reason why I point that out is if you look like the, the twenty the 2023, which we're still until the end of April in our 2023 license season. Um, it does look like, at least on the single family side, the number or that percentage has gone up. Um, one thing that we have seen is, um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen and heard and read about it, the number of folks who are coming in getting so-called insurance permits. Um, people who have some fear that the ordinance may change, that a cap goes in place, and if they don't come in and get grandfathered, they may not be able to have the ability to rent the property in the future. So if you look back at the last four years, I mean, we're, we're basically going within like tenths of a percent um, on the single family side, 10.3%, actually went down to 10.1%, back up to 10.4, 10.7. I mean, we're, we're really talking like fractions of a, of a percent. Um, this year, uh, we, we have, um, at least anecdotally, and I think looking at also some of the, um, the well, in here, business license revenue, um, the number of, of properties that are coming in and actually reporting zero for the base amount. Um, 23, which comparatively is, is higher than what we've generally seen in typical years. So just because that number is, is up as opposed to the last several years doesn't necessarily indicate that those properties are, are actually and actively being rented. So just kind of a, a qualifier, and you can give any number of qualifiers about the thing. Um, but that, that was one I, I think where it's not a huge number, but we have seen, I would say, probably more than we have in the past um, with with those zero to two thousand income range. Um, but you do have on the on the bar chart, you do have a, a column for the active, and if you're comparing to twenty nineteen, again before COVID, so. What for COVID to now? No, that, that that's what I'm saying. Just because it's active, all that means is it has an active permit. It doesn't mean that it's actively being listed and offered for rent. So some people have come in, and this was a question that the mayor actually asked us a couple of weeks ago. Did we see a bump around the election in the number of people who came in and asked or applied for new permits? And we had during that two week period, 18 um permit applications if you look two years ago the same two-week period was zero so i mean it's definitely something that we're seeing and i think you know to, to look at that and draw a conclusion that it's an actual you know increase in the number of properties that are actively being rented i, I, I don't know that if you go deeper into the data that you well, what's the difference between yeah. unique and active so a unique property means it's rented at any point during the year. Um, so what would happen if, if somebody comes in, they own a property, they purchase a permit, they rent it for a few months, um, that property gets sold and the new owner chooses to move into it, make it their full-time residence. Um, we treat that as a unique permit because it was rented at some point during that permit year. Um, but after it's sold and the new buyer chooses not to obtain a new permit, then it's no longer an active permit. So the reason why we use unique is we feel that it, 
it gives a better indication uh, of kind of more of an apples to apples comparison that in any given year, we can look at how many properties have the ability to rent mm -hmm. at any point during that year. But I thought you said they, they were rented at some point during the year. They have the ability to rent. It doesn't mean that they were actually offered or rented. The other thing I looked at was the number of units because more properties are being built or, or under construction. So when we say, well, the percentage has been 20 to 25, but the number of short-term rentals has increased because the number of properties have been increased. So that's the other one. Yeah. But I still, I guess the biggest um, complaint against rentals that I have heard from various sources is that we've had this huge jump in short-term rentals. And I don't think we've had a huge jump looking at all this data and all the other data. It hasn't been a huge jump. It's more properties, which I've always agreed with that, but it's still basically the same percentage, a fourth of the island rents. And this other, this also doesn't take into account, I have many homes that only rent Memorial Day to Labor Day. And that doesn't, this is not reflected in this data, okay? Um, and then the owners live in them the rest of the year, okay? Um, and it, it's mainly in a lot of the larger homes, that's how, that's how it's done. And I don't know, I don't think there's any way to really break that down. But these permits, if somebody rents for one week, they have to get a permit. The so, only way to break down is by that one that he was just showing where, where they report what their estimated revenue is. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way to see that. But right. that's going off of what they think or what they might. Right. right. Again, we still don't know. Right. Well, Susan actually just asked me a question. I should add this to my definition of what constitutes a unique permit. I mentioned if someone um, rents it for part of the year, they sell it, a new person chooses not to rent it. We still count it even though it's no longer active. Um, there may also be instances where you have one property owner who owns the property for part of the year, they sell it mid-year, the new owner um, comes in and pulls uh, a new permit because those permits are not transferable. Um, in that case, we've actually issued two rental permits for that property, but we're still going to treat it as just one unique property um, because it's still at some point during even though there were multiple owners that's at some point during that year that property was offered um, for rent so that that's why we usually recommend using the um, the unique number um, instead of active because literally we can push out an active number and five minutes later that number is no longer uh, balanced they're, they're coming and they're going uh, all the time um, the number this is from last Monday. I don't even know if this is still uh, a valid number. They're they're literally constantly changing. Um, so using the unique number, it, it gives us something that's more stable over the course of the year. Um, and you can I, I think draw better comparisons in terms of the number of properties that that actually have the ability to rent. Uh, but I, I I did want to throw that out just as, as really a major qualifier that just because they have a permit, that means that they have the ability of, to rent if they choose to, but they may not actually be uh, renting or intending to rent. But you, you've you used the, you, you're not consistent with, so you, when you talk about unique, and you, then you said that it's been rented or offered to rent, but then it sounds like it doesn't have to have unique has a permit. Yeah, so yeah. It, that's that's what you mean to be saying is that unique has a permit, yes. but not necessarily offered for rent. It could be offered for rent and could be rented legally because they have a permit. Doesn't necessarily mean that it was actively being rented or offered. The other thing I thought was very interesting is we've heard um People saying corporations are coming in and buying up um, properties here on Seabrook, but 98.1% only have people only own one unit. There's only 0.2% um, of people own three units or more. So I 
don't see that corporations are buying up. And then if you look at the last page, when it looks at short-term rent, the revenue, literally, if anybody wants to say people are making a lot of money on rentals, you just need to look at that graph. Very few people are making a lot of money on rentals. At best, they're offsetting some costs. Right, right. And you can see here that these are obviously not being rented year-round. Right. These ones that are falling off at the end of the beginning <laughs> because these are the ones that are <clears throat> just during a very yeah. specific period, obviously. <laughs> yeah. and, and to kind of highlight the point, the terms unique and active and different things, we see on there, total number this is the this is drawn from business license data the number there was 632 and we had mentioned there were 604 unique properties and i think it was 580 active that just kind of illustrates how um, you do have instances where there's multiple permits that are issued for a, a property so we know there were 604 unique so 28 um, properties had multiple permits issued. Um, so usually that's going to be the property is sold and then you know the prior owner and the new owner both rented. But as far as, as our tracking, um, we track it as one unique permit. Um, and then active, some of those 632, the property's been sold or you know they're no longer intending to rent it. Um, and then that's how we get to the active permits. Um, as some of those may be removed as well. Um, so that's how we got to the, the 580 um, active permits. I thought I read that if if I have a rental property and I sell it, but I have reservations after my closing date, wasn't there something that the new owner could honor? Have they to, have to honor. They have, have to. Okay. Have State to. law. So, so would so that then just be an extension of the original permit yeah. in your so in our, our current ordinance, the permit is non-transferable. So if someone's buying property, there might be like three days that they're that they have to honor for the prior owner. And I think the law is they have to honor 90 days um, after closing. Um, they that new owner has to come in and pay the full amount for a permit. We issue the permit. Um, a lot of times that owner has no intention of renting beyond <laughs> um, reservation. those reservations, but unless they contact us to notify us and actually cancel the permit, it still stays on the books as an active permit, um, likely yeah. until we do the next renewal period, and then they just don't renew it. Um, but um, that was one of the things we looked at last year in the draft ordinance was um, um, some some sort of mechanism where you could do like a temporary permit um, that um, when a, a property is sold and that that sale is subject to existing rental agreements, that would allow uh, the new owner if they have no intention of continuing to rent it beyond there uh, beyond that period to do a temporary permit at a reduced rate, uh, and then that permit would automatically expire. Yeah. Uh, at the conclusion, so kind of like temporary. prorated fee, you know, depending on how many months Basically. they had to extend. Yeah, okay. um, I also, but that, that's not in the current one. Excuse me. I also have owners who buy properties, um, or they move in. I shouldn't say they buy; they move into their properties permanently, and they've had a um, short-term rental permit. And they've said, "Do not cancel my short-term rental permit because I've paid for it for the whole year, just in case something would change." So. Those are still counted as active, even though owners have moved into them permanently. But I mean, again, they because it has an active permit, it okay. could be rent. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is, but it, it could be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they went to Europe for a month and they decided they wanted to rent it while they were gone, as long as they have that permit, they right. have the authority to do that. Uh, to Nancy's point about who owns and 98.1% uh, of our own one unit. Um, uh, I think that's, that's good news. We, uh, it's consistent with what uh, we've heard from so many people. Um, but the one thing that we, uh, I don't think that captures some of the 
there are some corporate entities that own uh, houses that they only have one right now. So, but that may not be captured. But the overall numbers are basically the same because there's just a few like that. Um, the one thing I thought in the comments that was pretty universal is that people were um, uh, not. <laughs> We did not want, we're, we're happy to have regulations on corporate ownership, again, not family corporate, but real corporate ownership. Um, and it's, it seems clear that there's not a lot of it now, but everybody's, um, it seems to be a lot of consensus on that issue that um, would be nipping something in the pot. Right. And, it's by this chart. and I think this just supports the fact that a lot of people buy to use it as a vacation home for their family and then they rent to offset their cost. Right. Okay. No, there's no reinforcing yeah. that. Yeah, no, no question about that. Okay, uh, Susan. Okay, well, thank you yeah, the... for giving me the time to present this. <laughs> so I, I spent quite a bit of time on this. And I think the first thing is looking at the overall numbers, there were a lot of duplicate responses from a, a, a resident. So what I did is I kind of removed those and brought it down to one comment per resident, which I thought was fair, you know, versus husband and wife and anybody else. Or, or some people quite honestly took the time to make four or five comments. So when I did that, I actually brought the number down to 395 individual resident comments. Out of that, when I counted it, it um, 84 of them, a count of 84 were yes to caps and that was 21%. 217 at 55% were for no caps. And then there were a lot of them reading through 75 actually, reading through that, really they, they gave some very nice in-depth comments, but if I didn't get a yes or no in that comment. So I left that as basically, you know, in, in a whole separate category because I wanted to be really clear that what their meaning was. I mean, I could have leaned some of them one way or the other, but unless they specifically said yes or no to a cap, I get I left them out. So again, noted. No to caps, where it was a count of 217, which was 55%. Yes to caps were 21% at an 84 count. In the comments that I kind of overall, but also the ones that I had a hard time putting into that yes or no category, you know, and I know we talked about this off and on, a lot of enforcement issues, questions, and a lot of gate pass issues. I think some people don't realize the um, the new rule that has gone in that rental units cannot call it a gate pass now. So still, you know, comments on that, that renters are calling the gate passes for their, you know, for visitors that are coming in. But as we know, they can no longer do that. Um, some comments were, and I, I didn't put them in yes or no, but caps for single family homes, but no on the villas. So I wasn't quite sure how to categorize it. put it into a category. A lot of club issues that it, um, you know, overcrowding, I can't get a tea time. It, um, you know, just a lot, a lot of comments on that, but not putting it into a category again of yes or no. Some want more data before decision making. And some asked, you know, not to have a decision rush. There were 19 that had attachments that I couldn't access happen. So I, I couldn't do anything with those. So that, that rounds that number up to the 395. What I thought was interesting is I also broke it down. There was a category to say if you were a resident or not. And so I broke that down, residents, yes or no. Um, 142 were residents, that's 36 responses from residents. 253 were non-residents at a 64% count. What I thought was interesting too, of that 142 residents, 132 of those did not own and 10 did own a short-term rental. Also of the 142 residents, 64 said yes to caps, a 45% count, and 55 of the residents, a 39% said no to caps. 
And 18, again, went into that category that I couldn't put them in yes or no, which was 12%, and five of them had attachments that I couldn't access. Um, I think overall, lot, you know, for me, reading them, and I really had to read them, like I said, to be able to get someone quite clear, yes, I want a cap, or no, I want a cap, you know, one sentence, and then maybe some comments. Um, I really felt, especially if a lot of new owners responded, and a lot of new owners are doing short-term rents, and the anxiety that is out there on what's going to happen. Um, you know, I, I don't want to specifically pull out any, any certain comments, but sometimes I don't know if I felt like I was on the same line. Actually, one of them said they have a problem with motorcycles. We don't have no cycles. Well, you know, I really had to stop and think about that. <laughs> anyways, just saying that's one of the comments they have problems with, you know, okay, things on the balcony you and the trailer. Okay. You could ride a motorcycle and you could that's very true. true. And I, quite honestly, I didn't go back to look at his address okay. because I had to scratch my head and say, Am I missing something? Yeah, motorcycles on bay. How do you have a motorcycle? I can sneak them in on a trailer cover. And they just bring them in, and then we have motorcycles. We had motorcycles last summer. We they ride them? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds like enforcement. Sounds like an enforcement. <laughs> yeah. But maybe this person was, I don't, like I said, I didn't go back to look at the address because, quite honestly, on my screen, going all the way across, I only had certain, you know, view as I was going through it. But I um, was quite shocked about that one. So, anyways, I just felt a lot of angst. Um, the ones obviously for yes for caps. Um, I thought one of the more interesting type of comment was they came here as a you know as a renter. They bought in the early years, you know, before they were able to be here full time and own an SDR, and now they're here full time, but they don't believe that there should be a large amount of rental units on the island. So I thought that was an interesting type of category, you know, for comments. So uh, that's, you know, it's hard for me to probably categorize some of them going back and forth because obviously my feelings on this, but I, I guess one of the overwhelming ones is that anxiety for these newer owners that have an STR and where things are going. But thank you for letting me present that. Sure. So um, when you say resonance, you, you're able to categorize by... Um, they're, they're they're not the, the, the full-time resident. That so one of the categories in the in, you know in the corridor was resident, and you could answer yes or no. So I'm assuming that they would say yes if they were a full-time resident, and no if they were not. And then so self-reporting. So <laughs> right. Um, when you so a lot of people said. Uh, they were against banning short-term rental. No. Well, no, I mean, I I know a lot of people did because I've read all the comments. Did you categorize, if they said, I'm against banning short-term rentals, did you characterize? I didn't break that down. I just looked at it. No. No. Um, well, they okay, said with just... no to cap or yes to cap. Okay. So if they said no to bans on short-term rentals, you did not include that in the caps. Okay, I'm sorry, say that again. There's a difference between banning short term rentals and capping short term rentals, right? Yeah, I guess. So I broke it down that they said yes to having caps or no to having caps. I did not take if their, com if their comments said please ban short term rentals. Is that what you're asking? No. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, let me just, just take this back. Okay. Do you agree that there's a difference between banning? short-term rentals and capping. Oh, absolutely, okay. yeah. There were many people who said, uh, you know, short-term rental owners who said, don't take away my short-term rentals, don't ban short-term rentals. I, I read those. I mean, yeah, no, I'm not So what that. I'm saying, okay, so I what I'm asking the question that. is, did you include those in terms of people who, who were in the no category for caps, which is a different There'd be category. no caps or um, I probably left them in the, the, the 75 count of that. I couldn't put them into a category. Okay. If they specifically in the, in their comments said did not say no or yes, I, I wasn't going to make the judgment call on what they felt. Okay. 
And do you, so you have a spreadsheet of all this? I do. I included it into the, um, because you, you, you can share my spreadsheet, yeah. Yeah. Catherine. So this is what it looks like, just to show everyone. Um, this is what she's talking about. So it's, so it's, I titled them up on the top what, um, yeah, it says like their name, their address, if they're an STR owner, their resident, or if they're an owner, if they're a resident, they're an STR owner, and if they're a real estate agent, and then it's got their comment that they submitted here. And these are the ones that were, I believe, just the ones that were submitted through our portal that we had, mm -hmm. and then the date, the timestamp. Um, when you look at the date submitted, you can see, you can kind of correspond that with the PDF files that are in the share drive for everyone to view. And that's where you can get some of the attachments um, that are included. If you see that there's an attachment that says in their comment to go towards it, um, that's where you can get that. But this is, um, and thank you, Susan, for going through this. <laughs> no, you're fine, but does, does yours, because it's a shared fault, it's a shared file. So can you see like columns K, L, M, Okay, so that's what, what I did. I, you know, I did the caps, yes, caps, no. When mine was, did not count, commit. So that's just what I called it. And that's the one, it literally, I could not read, you know, in that comment, read it, I mean, the yes or no, I did not put them in a category. Okay. So if they said, please ban STRs, they didn't go into a category. Okay. Well, and then I, I was saying, likewise, if they, Said, please, please do not be. Please do not be. Yeah, no, because okay. it really was the, the to me the question was are they in favor of caps or are they not in favor of caps? Okay. And so Catherine, I, I couldn't read the column headings up there, but what I thought I saw yesterday when I concluded reading all the comments was that, but it didn't have Susan's. Additional additional columns. Are you saying that the? I mean, I just received this today, so it okay. Well, then that's the okay. Well, then that's that's the reason that I didn't see Susan's additional columns when I did it yesterday. So what I'm saying is, is that with Susan's columns now in the shared drive or it's going to be? Yes, this file is in the shared drive. Yeah, and that's a spreadsheet of Excel or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Then, anything no, else? No, that's it. Just, yep, that's it. Yeah. So, um, I did, I completed my review of the, of the comments yesterday. And I wanted to uh, talk about what I got from those. But before I do, um, why don't I go last? Does anyone else want to say anything about yeah. I, their I reviews of the comments? Yeah, I read all of them. It was very painful and time consuming. I read all of them. Um, and I broke them down into three categories, not as detailed as you, Susan. Thank you for doing all that. But I had them in. I have a rental property, I don't have a rental property, and then I have this small group that we're trying to suggest compromise between the two sides. Um, and I noticed a lot that thought we were gonna ban short-term rentals. Um, but when I was making calls to the presidents of COVAR, they started talking to me about the comments and they had gone out and read them. And I don't wanna mention any names, but what I was told is that Terrence Little and Paul and Sue McLaughlin were taking the hit for taking a position of wanting caps, and that a lot of the owners that they had talked to, and especially Preserve Seabrook, left them take the hit, although they want caps, they would not post in the comment portal. So what we're lacking are people that you know, want caps, whether they're full-time or part-time owners, they want caps, but they were too afraid to put their name out there. And I can relate to them because now my name's being slammed um, on some website here on Seabook that I mentioned to some of you before the meeting, unfairly because they're 
accusing me of things I didn't do. Sadly, people are between next door getting so vicious and this portal of everybody reading the comments and then not wanting to post their own, we sadly don't hear from a lot of people because they're too afraid to to put their name on anything and, and then be harassed. So I just want to point out that these comments were interesting, but it doesn't represent the whole population. It's basically my opinion. Yeah, and I, and I'm going to piggyback on that and offer a little bit of a contra is that I, we got to be careful that we don't assume that all 500 or however many people there are in preserving right. Seabrook are all on, again, Paul was rep in his life of representing that group. We shouldn't say that all 500 of them are in that camp either. We really don't know. And I, I don't know how to react to, I mean, I agree with you. I'm getting, I, I won't say attacked, but I get pulled out of the line at the grocery store because, see, you're on that. You're in that yeah. group. So that's kind of like an attack. Yeah. But at the same time, if people really felt strongly there, we gave them an opportunity to voice their opinion. And if they chose not to, I don't know which bucket to put them in. So okay. I, 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 well, I'm I reached, arguing both sides. I think. Yeah. I reached out to Paul via email and just asked him, like, he had sent a, an email out just in the last couple of weeks and said, if you're part of my Preserve Seabrook email group and you don't want to be in it anymore, please tell me and I will, I will drop you from my, my group. And he, I asked him, I said, you know, what is the response? And he said three people asked to be dropped from his Preserve Seabrook email group. And he said he still had close to 500. And in some homes he had one email, but the spouses. So I know that's not scientific accuracy, but I think a lot of the People and I can tell you right now, I saw a list of reserve Seabrook a while back. It wasn't just full time residents. Right. I had people that I know were part well, of the owners. Yeah, part could, of that is because join. I had people tell me they joined, they signed for Renew 50 and the Yacht Club, not for the caps. That's why. So that's that why, why you need them. to be. If we're gonna if we're gonna take that, it needs to be by category. Because I know people have come up to me and said, you know, I signed this because I was against Renew 50 or I was against the Yacht Club. Not because I'm against caps. But that's why he gave them a chance to nix their name from his mail group. So but I, I agree with him. I mean, himself. I don't think I it's agree because if you nix your name, you're not for one or the other. Right. I mean, but I mean, I'm just saying in general, people are afraid to post their opinion. They are. And and he sent emails out saying, I'm worried. We need a, we need more people need to talk. I mean, some of those emails were forwarded to me by people. Well, and I had people say to me, I'm too afraid to yeah. post anything because I see what, what's being happened. There's a small group of people next door that are just attacking, you know, anybody that posts anything that differs from their opinion on next door. And so people are just to the point that, that stresses them out. And so they don't want to post anywhere because it's a handful of people, whether they're for or against whatever. They're just vicious, and and I myself, I only say I love your picture, thank you for sharing, or I'll help you find your dog. But I don't want to comment on that. Well, I don't but it's, like it's crazy town. Yeah. But I do think instead of pulling people together, I think it has divided. See, oh, this island, actually, so, so divided more yeah. than ever. But I thought it was nice that some people tried to come up with compromises. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. That's why it was hard to put them into a category, yes or no. There were a lot of, here's an idea, why don't we do this? Right. So, and it was interesting reading those. Yes. You know, people very genuinely trying to say, you know, Try maybe we could do this or, you know, offer a um, compromise on something or maybe, you know, putting in a, um, like, you know, having it set up where if we do have a situation where we need to pull the plug because there's so many licenses, it's ready to go. Just like when we did shut down for COVID, you know, the town did that immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was here for all those months and I can't remember all of a sudden it seemed like overnight, bam, you know, we couldn't have renters here. So, so it was interesting that there were a lot of, you know, thoughts and ideas yeah. in, in the portal. I agree with that. I, uh, I, I, I also painfully read all of them and, um, and sat through all of the hours of uh, of comments one on one with people. Some of them were really heart wrenching um, for both sides of the point. And um, the one thing I came away with was is that people weren't listening to us. 
they were not listening to what we were trying to accomplish. They were saying that you want to just ban STRs. Well, that was never the point of what this group or this committee was meant to do, was to ban STRs. The other thing was is that people were concerned about losing, and it's an emotional thing. This is not only a business thing. This is an emotional thing. You're going to take away income. Well, I'd be emotional about that, too. I think that that's a big deal. But I think we always said that we wanted to be fair. And we need to look at, as a group, what, what they said to us. And they were talking about, are you going to grandfather us? Are we? We don't know yet. We're only here to make a recommendation. But I know that we're not going to ban STRs. All we're looking to do is talk about capping it and coming up with, with some form of uh, process. And then the other thing that I really noticed on the pro caps came from a lot of people from neighborhoods. Not so much from villas or condos. They came from the neighborhoods. People were concerned about what was going to happen to my neighborhood? Is it going to be just a, a, a common thing like it's happened out at, at Bali Beach where people are ex exiting the island as fast as they possibly can because STRs have just taken over and there's no more sense of community anymore? I heard that an awful lot. And, and I also heard people say, I have the right to rent my property. Do you have the right to rent? I don't know. I don't know if you have the right or not, but I know what you have to do is you have to fill out a permit. And that permit has to be approved by the town. So I don't know if you have a right, but you definitely can and you can apply. Is it going to be approved? I don't know. But if we put caps on it, at least we'll have something in place that can slow the process down. And I think that's where I came from, from hearing with people other than gate passes and all sorts of other things that were on there. Thank you. Um, I agree. I When I read all the comments, um, two things popped out. The majority was that the people who rent, rent to offset their costs. That that was what the majority overwhelming said. It wasn't that they were making oodles of money on it, but they were renting to offset their costs and they hope to eventually retire here. Not necessarily in the property they're in, but to buy, what most people end up doing is buying a house if they have a villa and then the villa turns over to a rental. Once again, the process continues. Second thing I, heard, I also saw was um, People in the homes, the residential, well, they're all residential, but in the home areas where there's the homes, they're more concerned about it. And I can understand that they wouldn't want, I wouldn't, you, nobody would want a rental on both sides of them. Okay. Um, the, but it, the villa owners were the ones that primarily I saw were saying that they don't feel like there should be a cap. Um, so I would hope that we would, you know, take that into consideration. Homes, um, one street seems to be the biggest problem. Um, Baywood seems to be a big issue. Um, enforcement was a big issue I, I saw when I read things. Um, that and maybe just a better way of reporting things that when Tyler calls and says, you know, Mike calls and old Tyler calls and says there's an LSV with um, Park on the Pine Straw and we get it taken care of. How is that reported? Mike reports it, we need to then let the owners know. Um, I think a little bit of common sense goes in there too. I mean, an LSV on the pine straw, is that something the owners need to know, really concerned about? A party at the house most definitely. Um, I don't know how many, how often we have parties here on houses. I haven't seen many, usually we're the BBT club, bed by 10, everybody on Seabrook, so. <laughs> I, I haven't seen a lot of parties, um, but um, I think it's very important that we take into consideration what these people took a lot of time to put their comments in. And um, I was surprised there were not more comments um, in favor of caps on, on the portal. Just your comment about the LSV. I just reported something last night 
and I ended up as the owner in the house. I know, they called me. Okay. Yeah. So what I was hoping was conveyed to them was we've had a lot of water pipe breaks. Yeah. And they were parked right where the water pipes, pipes go in. And I had a water pipe break for another reason. And what was interesting and what I was going to share with the owner, and then I decided, no, I'm just going to put it in the portal, is when the utility company comes out, the water pipe breaks, they'll pay if it's up to the meter. But if it's between the meter and the house, you have to hire a plumber to fix it. Oh, so people don't realize when they break water pipes, they could incur a big bucks right. bill. And that's why I'm trying to keep them off of the pine straw and landscaping. But we've had probably four water pipe breaks in the last four, um, two years. And, you know, they're without water sometimes. I'll come it. I'll come yeah, just, yeah. Because uh, what I found out with all these water pipe breaks is they're not that deep in the ground. Right. The sprinkler has been really close to the surface. That too, yeah. But I, you know, when they broke the news to me that it's between the meter and the house and you have to hire a plumber to fix it, and that's big bucks, you know, people don't want that to happen to them. Well, that, that specific example, I think, is a good example of why it would make sense to have a, a nuisance organ right. that addresses For everybody. The park. Everybody. I will just, totally yes, support that. That particular one, it was, it's a rental, so you can't park in the yard. But if it's not actively being rental, then that but provision is allowed. But here's the other thing. Summerwind has its own rules and regulations, and part of our rules and regulations, we don't care if it's the owner, the guest, or the renter, they're not supposed to park in a pine straw. Mm -hmm. And we include the explanation is that part of it is because of the water pipes. So it's part of the rule of the association that that should come into play with the owner, but people don't read stuff. So that's a whole other story. But that's why I did what I did because I thought, oh, they're they're on top of the water pipes. Um, but before you move on, I know there's Daryl touched on it, Deb touched on. There's been some discussion about kind of areas where people live and areas where we see the concentration of you know where the majority of the rental properties are. Um, that was something that we were asked to compile. I, I think it's in the, the shared folder, but we do have an updated version of this table because. Don't think you have enough pieces of paper. Yeah, I need to know. Um, Thank you for putting that on a big piece of paper. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a blind. It's a blind. I appreciate it. Um, the, the stuff on the first page, it, it's, it's a lot of information. Um, some of it you may find relevant, some of it you may not. But um, all the stuff in the blue column, the yellow column, and the green column. That's why I gave these colors because it's a lot easier to <laughs> specify which one I'm talking about. But the blue, yellow, and green, you got all that information last time. Um, what we have added is the purple and the red, I think, um, columns. Um, the end of 2021, 22, and then we just got the 2023 data. Uh, we did go into county tax records and pull out um, the properties that were listed as and taxed as legal residents. Um, so we use that as our assumption that is an owner occupied property. In order to be a legal resident, you have to be owner occupied. Um, so we wanted to give you that a, a similar breakdown of um, the properties that are owner occupied. Now, these ones, we started doing that at the end of 2021, so we don't go all the way back to 2019. But I'm not going to go through all those specific numbers, but the uh, if you want to look through the different districts and regimes and whatnot, you can you can see how those change over time. Um, but what I did want to give you is kind of a a snapshot in time. So the next page, this is the um, um, basically the raw numbers, um, and this was for the 2023 owner occupied. Um, properties and um, the red columns are that's the number of active so it's not unique it's not totally it's active as of I think the day we had was March 18th so last Monday I think it was so just so you can kind of get a comparison of um, the single family non-regime areas the we, we call them RSF1 RSF2 those are zoning um, districts the single family that are in an association, like you know, the village and some of the other ones, um, those we put lumped all together with the villas and regimes. Um, so you can see, um, and just in terms of raw numbers, 718 in the single family districts uh, are owner occupied 
117 active short-term rental uh, permits as of last Monday. Um, the next one, the bill is the regimes, 1,340 properties, much lower, much lower number, um, 258 owner occupied. Um, in that instance, you had more um, active rental permits um, than owner occupied residences. And then you can see the total uh, on the right hand side. The last page is just a um, um, comparison. So this is the percentage of the total. So the single family, the RSF one and two districts, about 67% of all the homes are owner occupied um, and 10.9% 10, 10 have had an active rental permit as of last Monday. Um, on the flip side, the villas regimes, 19.3 um, owner occupied, 34.6, so nearly twice the percentage had a, um, uh, a short term active rental permit as of the end of last week. So that does kind of give you some comparison and I think kind of ties into some of the, com the comments that you were referencing that, you know, the comments seem to be a little bit different in the areas where you have those highest concentrations of owner-occupied properties um, than they were in areas where you had actually more rental properties than owner-occupied properties. Joe, is it possible to break this out just a little further? Because the um, SF3, there's they're just small lots with their single-family homes. And the clusters are also single family homes. So if you break out those two zones as single family homes, they're a little bit different than the condos and the townhouses. So I agree that the townhouses and the condos is the highest concentration of rentals. Mm -hmm. And and they're a little bit different than when you look at the small lot single family homes and the clusters because they're all single family homes. What clusters are you talking about? The clusters, some of them are clusters. So, actually, believe it or not, the cluster has the highest percentage. But there's of, less of them. There's, right, of there's them. fewer of them, but they have yeah. high, the highest percentage of, of rental percent. permits. Yeah, they, all of them. Yeah. The well, uh, what happens is the small lots, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, if I understand correctly, the <laughs> small lots, they own the lot. So the small, medium, and large, they own the lot. When you get into the clusters, they own to the drip line, and then the association owns the lot around it. So is that why that single-family cluster is different than the single-family small lot, because the association owns the property past the drip line? Is that I mean, it's right? ultimately just terminology that was assigned when the zoning, the DSO was being rewritten. Um, but that, that was the differentiation that the small lot owned the house and the, the property lot. surrounding it, whereas the cluster, even though they were detached residences, um, they didn't own, it was common area. That's what I Surrounding assume. the property. Yeah, because when I look at the breakdown, but they're, they're increasing in full-time residents slowly. So the single family homes are different than the townhouses and the condos. To me, I mean, I could, when I, because I get the, so. You mean like definitely. summer wind and turkey pond? Or you class yeah, they're, they're clusters, and there's more and more people living there full time. But I understand, when I look at, you know, High Hammock and Pelican Watch and all the, the townhouses and the condos, to me, they're a different category because I can see where they're more rental, that people aren't going to live there full time. Where when you look at the small lots and the clusters, people are starting to move in and live there full time because they're three bedroom homes, so they're not that small. But when you're looking at one and two bedrooms in these townhouses and condos, the tendency of people living there full time, some people do, but it's not small, it's much. What, yeah. what I thought was interesting, and, and this kind of went across the board with um, all the different categories, is we were seeing more properties become as a percentage, more pop properties becoming owner occupied. And you're also seeing from for most of them increases in the number of properties that were rental units. Right. So um you actually had both now the, the rates maybe weren't the same, but yeah. you were seeing an increase for for you know for most of them across the board over um, the several years. So um I, I think what we're seeing now are 
as that's happening, fewer properties are just part-time residents that is there, we're going to use it when we want it, but it's sitting empty um, when we're not using it. But that's so still really living in it or you're renting it. Yeah, that's really a, still a large percentage, isn't it, Joe? When I look like this yeah. family lot, I still see 20, if I'm doing math right, 22% would be part-time residents that don't rent or don't have access. Uh, 30, 32. 32, did I do my math wrong? Well, where are you at? Well, I'm looking at, I'm not sure what the pages are numbered, but it's the graph that shows single family that 66.9% are full time residents. 10.9% of that population are active at permits. So, whatever you add those two together, that's 78%. So, that would leave 22% that. 60. No, so it's like it's just call it 66.9 plus 10.9. Are you looking at the owner occupant? I'm on the graph on the bar graph on the, bar on the last page. On, He's on calculating the, the part time, aren't you? Ollie, you're calculating. Well, Joe, I'm trying to come up with part time owners. Yeah, what yeah. percent? Joe, are these yeah. even mutually exclusive? Like you could theoretically be uh owner occupant, but you get that tax rate because you live here, you're full time. Um, but you could. Theoretically, rent your house in the summer. Is that you correct? can do it up to seventy-two days, right? So oh, theoretically, yeah, so, so I think Ollie's trying to do a little basic yeah. subtraction or well, addition and subtraction, but it, but in reality, and it may not be a big number. I'm just saying that part of the of the owner occupied could itself be short term. So this, yeah. Is, so I was true enough. What I was trying to get to, I was trying to get to what. What percentage are part time that don't rent? Because if I was, you know, I'm not sure what bucket to call. I could say anti renter, pro cap, whatever you want to call it. I would be worried about that universe because that's the universe that could easily start to rent. Right. Right. Yeah, we we actually have the ability we can cross reference the owner occupied tax parcels with those that have a short term rental permit. There's a few that are owner occupied properties that rent at some point during the year. There's not a very good Not a very good So if you so take that they had out, a permit, they, you're, they're in the 10.9% if they had a permit. Is that how you did it? They would actually be in both. Both, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there, there might be a little bit of. The, the reason I'm pointing this out is if we do get into a discussion on caps and we start to talk about a recommendation. I would think, and this is just my opinion, that condos and townhouses would have a higher percent cap because that's really more of what happens there. Um, and maybe I'm just trying to protect myself, but I'm thinking the single family homes may gravitate more towards full time or people that are part time and don't rent. But definitely the townhouses and the condos to me is where the largest opportunity and the largest, you know activity for rental. And well, that's, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, Pelican Watch has 105 units, 10 are occupied, over occupied, you 10. Yeah. And uh, which I actually didn't even realize there were that many, the 10. But, you know, we are at just about 62% SDRs. And that, that, interestingly enough, is actually lower than it was in 2019. But I attribute that to, we had a lot of, you know, when prices went up, we had a lot of owners sell, owners that had been there for many, many years, sell for a lot of reasons. And, you know, they had, a lot of them had been their owner a long time, they were older, and it was just difficult to live in that yes. environment. So, you know, we know where some of them had moved to and some of them, you know, apartments that they don't have to care for things. So, you know, and, you know, quite honestly, we're at 61.9. I could see that going up because I know some units are being renovated. They're waiting for their renovations to be done and, you know, they'll probably get a um, get a license. So it, it is, you know, what's quite honestly, we are, you know, Pelican Watch is one of the highest. That um, It looks like Atrium is right below us at 68%. You know, and there, there's a lot of units in Atrium too. There's 44 units there. And, you know, as they were built, they were built to be rental units. Yeah, and I think we have to be careful when we're looking at like summer ones in Tarpon Ponds because they're always in the villas, townhomes, and cottages in the 
And that data. And that's what not they, they always need to be carved out. Because if you look at the number of short term rental permits, the townhouses, there's 116. And the condos, there's 223. The clusters is 95. So really, I mean, 95 sounds a lot, but there's 113 single family medium lots. You know, you see what I'm going on mm -hmm. the first page. So the bulk of those short term rental permits are the townhouses and the condos. And I think they need to be considered differently than the single family homes in the large lot, medium lot, small lot, and cluster homes. I just think. But in cluster homes, you're looking at 50% of summer when but there's only 95 and there's only 95 short term rentals versus 113 for medium lots. See what, see what I'm saying? Yeah. But I just mean, well, yeah, yeah. You may be talking about having three buckets. My brain is always around yeah. having two. That's what I, I think, was thinking, three yeah. buckets. And for the townhouses and the condos to have the most lenient, because that's where the, you know, the bulk of the short-term rental permits are. And they lend themselves to be used in that fashion. Or you do regimes versus non-regimes. Well, see, they're, the clusters are associations. They're not okay, regimes. associations. So when regimes. people use bill-in regimes, they're forgetting that the associations is a whole different bucket, too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I said, maybe it's me personally, I'm in a cluster, but I just feel like I see more and more people talking about coming there and living full-time because there's three bedrooms. So it's a, it's a nice downsizing when you retire to move into Tarpon Pond or Summerland or some of these other clustered homes because they're manageable and you have company da da da. But when you get into the condos and the townhouses, and there are and Trace is an example where she lives at Bay Point, and that's uh Bay Point is under the the condos, but there are people that live there full time too, but they're not as many. Um I, I'm just saying, and I'm jumping ahead here, but I'm just saying as we evaluate this information. I would appreciate having the buckets just a little bit different, but I look at it as three buckets. So I look at it as the zone uh, for single family large lots and single family medium lots as one grouping. I look at the single family home small lot and the clusters as another grouping because they're legally all single family homes. And I look at the townhouses and condos as a third grouping. And that's every time you give up data, I, that's how I. I look at it um, when I'm evaluating, you know, if we do get into our detailed discussion you now. But you, that, the good news is the zoning districts already accomplish your exactly. thing. So it's not. That's why I did it by zoning. Yeah, it's not hard to do. No. I mean, mentally, you might have to move it in your head from one bucket to the other, but the data is already categorized. Exactly. By zoning districts that and so now if you go back to the online comments and, and you evaluate the bulk of the online comments, you're going to find a lot of them are the condos and the townhouses that they're concerned. You know, hey, you know, I need the rent to cover my costs. Um, and as Nancy said they might have a condo, a townhouse right now, and they may sell it and want it to still be a rental. They're going to move up into either the three bedroom single family homes in the clusters and the small lots, or possibly, you know, move to the large lots and medium lots. But um, I, I just keep on looking at this as three buckets when I when I look at data and trying to understand the condos and the townhouses where the most lenient. Uh, you know, changes should be made because that really lends itself to the rental community. Now, I had a gentleman that owns a rental in Summerland, and his comment to me is, I'm for caps because I'll have less competition. So he owns a short term rental, but he wanted a cap, but he said, Then I have less competition because he sees more and more <laughs> neighbors becoming rentals. So there is that. Group of people to yep. have grasped that concept. But uh, I'm just throwing this out from reading the com comments and looking at the data that Joe's put together. That's that's how it's. Yeah, well, ultimately, there's not a right or wrong way to categorize I these. Um, it, actually, in the past, working with the last committee, we included SF1, 2, and 3 as single family, and then we put the 
the cluster, the townhome, and multifamily together. So they're two separate roofings. Uh, I know when we talked and you were asking for the data, you wanted to kind of see yeah. how it broke down between the Covar areas and the non-Covar, which is why we, we moved the single family yeah. three districts down. But I mean, ultimately, I'm, we, I'm looking we have at single family homes versus condos and townhouses. Is how I'm looking at it. Yeah, I mean, you could even make an argument. A lot of places they consider townhome single family, or single family attached, not detached. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's, it's kind of right. fluid how you can categorize it. Well, we'll we 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 will we will be discussing those issues in the upcoming weeks. But Joe, um, back to Ollie's point, it would be possible to know how many non-owner occupied uh, units are not. Being um, rented. rented, right? I mean, the idea of Ollie's point is um, so there's a lot of people now who use their place as a second home and uh, vacation home, and they don't rent, but just in terms of trends and where they're going, how, how many of those are there? Because if, if a significant portion of those were to decide to start renting, that would be a shift in the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And um, and we know from the comments that many of those people said, I'm not renting now, but I'm gonna have my options open for the future. So that, that number should be easily obtainable, yeah, right? We, it's we, people we, in the we, different tax in the 6% who don't have a permit. Yeah, we'd be able to, to back into it. So we know the total number of properties. We know how many are owner occupied. Um, we can pull, um, we can find out exactly the overlap between those that are owner occupied that also have permit. So we can we can back into yeah, it. And, and not and and non non owner occupied that don't have a permit. Yeah. So we we know it's going to be. So if you look at the total number, the total of all residential units, 2023, 40.4, and this is across all zoning districts, all types, um, just about 40% owner occupied, 24% had a rental permit. So that's 64%. We know there's going to be some small amount of overlap, probably less than 1%. Um, so I mean, just roughly speaking, you say about two thirds are either owner occupied or have a uh, rental permit and a third uh, are neither. Um, they're just available, they're not owner occupied, they're not, um, don't have a permit to rent. Um, but we, we can get a, a precise number, but it's it's probably gonna be about two thirds and one third. Okay. Nancy, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, it, and again, probably said this already, but that to me, it, that's the group you want to monitor because the, the, those who are full-time residents are likely to stay full-time residents. Those who are in kind of running now are likely to continue to rent. If, if you're worried about there being a big uptick in the volume of renters, it's going to come from that. That That's the group you have to keep an eye on because they could go either way. Okay. Nancy, did you have any um, additional comments? Because I know we got sort of moved in a different direction, but okay. Mm -hmm. No, I other than what I've said already, I don't think I had anything unique you guys have all kind of Okay. And Susan, I know you presented, but do you have anything additional? No, but I think this is really, really helpful to look at because it really shows the difference. You know, to Deb's point, and thank you very much for making that point. It um the difference in like the single family homes, you know, 5.5%. And then you, you know, you zip down to the multifamily condos and you're at 41%. So there is a huge difference in percentage on where those rentals are hitting. And quite honestly, when you look at the map that you gave us last week, you can really see, especially, you know, right around the ocean between Pelican Watch and, you know, Atrium, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, yeah, it's been her, yeah, they're all right there. That you know that concentration of the rental units. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, nope, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Well, I um, 
So I do have reactions to the comments that um, I wanted to, to go over uh, because I do appreciate everybody uh, putting their comments in and, and they uh, deserved the time of everybody in this committee to read them and we all did, and first of all. And so uh, I do appreciate the efforts of everybody in the committee uh, to do that. It's, it, uh, it, 450 is actually a lot of comments uh, to read, so we, we appreciated those. Um, I do, and it is unfortunate and a sign of the times that I uh, know a lot of people who told me that um, their, their comments but didn't want to put it down on paper subject to public view because of uh, what goes on these days. So I don't, um, uh, so first of all, my overarching comment is that uh, I don't consider the, the comments a referendum. It's, it's fine to tally them up, but um, I look at the comments for um, what I can learn from them. And, uh, and I learned a lot and the ideas uh, presented, but um, and the themes presented, I'm going to go through some of those now. Um, so uh, you know, a lot of them I can go through quickly because I already spoken about them in the past. There were a lot of people who were concerned that we were out to ban uh, short-term rentals, as I've said before, including at the end of the last meeting. That's never been on the agenda, so it's unfortunate that those people were misled into thinking that. Um, one of the things that I was certainly um, clued into in a, in a much more vivid way than I had uh, previously thought um, is the many people who don't rent now but don't want any caps because they may uh, want to do so in the future or need to do so in the future so they want to keep their options open um, and this Ali is what you were just talking about mm -hmm. a minute ago and there were many of those um, I, I, we have to I, I have to think about that and we're going to be discussing that, so I'm not today saying anything about what to do with it. Um, but it was, um, uh, but certainly clear that a lot of people, even though they don't rent and probably uh, prefer not to rent, so they can come down and enjoy Seabrook whenever they want, uh, want to have their want to keep their options open. Again, don't know what we're going to do with that, but I certainly want those people to know that it's been uh, certainly paid attention to the to the point of view. Um, another theme: these are not necessarily in any particular order, um, but just go through them. Another theme uh, from a, a bunch of people is that there will be litigation, and we shouldn't do anything because there will be litigation and there could be, um, and it could be expensive. Um, I was a commercial litigator for four years and handled commercial litigation for a bank. So as I tell people, um, and a lot of people sue, sue banks because that's where the money is. So as I tell people, if I didn't do what I think is the right thing because somebody says they're going to sue, um, I would have been paralyzed for many years. Um, I uh, believe they have to do what you uh, believe is the right thing to do. Consult the lawyers and the town now has a very fine law firm representing it. There's nothing that we will do that will not be vetted by our lawyers. Um, so the fact that if we think something is legal, 
and we do it, but somebody could sue anyway, is not something that will persuade me. The question is, is it the right thing to do? And is it legal? And the fact that somebody may sue um, is unfortunate, but to me, it doesn't persuade me. I do, um, I have read the summary judgment decision by the court in the Folly Beach case. The uh, court ruled that, and that Folly Beach um, acted legally in imposing short-term rental caps. That's not in any way to say that, uh, and the court was not concerned, of course, whether Folly Beach did the right thing, Folly Beach did the wise thing, Folly Beach did the prudent thing. The question was, did Folly Beach do the legal thing? And it, it held that it did. There was an appellate decision earlier for some earlier Folly Beach uh, rules, so those were COVID rules, but had very broad language about the rights of municipalities um, to do this uh, sort of thing. And so um, I, while I very much want to do the right and prudent thing, um, we will have our lawyers tell us whether it's legal and beyond that. I would not be deterred by threats of litigation. Um, and sort of that feeds into the next thing about property rights. Um, the um, So there was a template, and like you would do with Congress when organizations say, please send this note to your congressperson. Um, and that's fine. I it's not object to it. Um, the things that were much more meaningful to me were individual stories, the individual, um, uh, very thoughtful um, uh, analysis and, and, and also compromises, things that people thought could be done for compromise. But the template uh, for the, those who don't, um, who haven't read these things like we have is uh, basically contains um, four elements. It asks the town to quote, stand down, close quote, um, not to impair their fundamental property rights, uh, that the full-time owners are a 40% minority, as we know it's actually a little bit above that, and there, therefore we should let SAPOA, quote, litigate, close quote, the issue. So the first couple of times I read it, I what it was sort of funny because I didn't hadn't figured it was a template that somebody had put out on social media that everybody should use, but because I thought the word stand down was a little bit weird because it's like in the suspense movies where the pilot's about to fire the missile, but the terrorist has already been taken out, so the order comes in to stand down. Um, it's a little bit odd usage in this context. And then um, litigate the issue when you're not talking about a court thing, but just decide the issue is, I guess, could be, it, it, it's not, that's also sort of a not typically used usage. So then I started noticing, and then I don't know if there were, and maybe Susan has a better idea whether there are 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 of them, I sort of lost track. But there are a lot of people who said that. Um, so we, again, I, I want to do the prudent thing. Um, and certainly, uh, considering the, what, People have done by buying a property, um, but in terms of again, if there's a legal element to it about the property rights, South Carolina law is quite clear that um, a town has the right to impose a cap, for example. And if there is, um, and then in term in terms of the issue between the town and Sapoa. Uh, I've already, I spoke about that at the last meeting at Links, so I'm not going to do that again, but I, I, I understand that's the position of a 
a lot of people out there and have, and have already spoken to that. Um, the, a lot of people, um, so a lot of full-time residents, and, and this is subjective, but I, I actually thought the full-time residents who wrote were, uh, took sort of balanced approaches, which I, I, with maybe one or two exceptions, I can't remember, but maybe one or two exceptions. None, none of the full-time residents say that we want to get rid of short-term rentals on the island. No, no one said we want to uh, cut back dramatically. Um, so I do think that the full-time residents who were for CAPS generally took a pretty balanced approach. Um, I think that the um, uh, short-term rental permit owners who wrote in pursuant to the very, to the templates and things like that uh, took a very hard line approach, which is no caps whatsoever. There's no problem. Don't do caps. Um, and which is not to say that a number didn't not did not write in and recognize that everybody should try to compromise, et cetera. But I did sort of see that difference. Um, one of the things that became uh, clear to me, again, and there are complexities to all this, which is why these comments are so helpful, that there were a few people who said that if, if there's a cap um, and you grandfather people, we should be grandfathered because we bought and we are in the, pro we bought a lot and we're in the process of building a house. And it was our intention to rent it out. And um, and so we're under construction with that, but we can't have a short-term rental permit yet <clears throat> because we don't have a house yet. Can't get a permit to have a house. And um, so I said, okay, that's something that, that we have to think about um, because that, to me, that's one of the value of these comments is to, okay, now I would say that grandfathering, we need to think about people who are in process but can't yet get a permit, but have already um, expended monies based on the expectation that they would be able to do a short-term rental. So I appreciate, I appreciate those uh, comments. The um, one big thing that's we all understand is for many people, a cap has already been quasi-imposed by the club, that the club is making it so expensive that um, you're, you're not going to have people uh, buy because it's it, the joining fees cost too much, et cetera, et cetera. And as we um, have discussed many times, we don't have control over that. And I'm, and I'm not getting to the fight over what the club uh, joining fees are, who should be allowed to be on the drawing range before one PM, anything like that. But it did, um, and then consistent with that, it's a number of people said uh, the club's too crowded. If you want to, if you want to deal with that, just get rid of Island One. The um, thing that Sapoa and the club did years ago that requires joint by any new property. And again, I'm not getting into that, but I will say that one thing that did occur to me as a result of that is, um, what if what if Zippoa and the club did do that? Uh, I think if you take these comments to their logical conclusion, that could result in a big spur of additional short-term rentals because now you could have people who would who could buy without without those substantial joining fees of the club and without that, and then they can rent their properties out as uh, ones that you can't use the club amenities, but the beach and, and everything else. And so when people have said, well, we're not gonna have another pandemic, so you don't have to worry about a thing. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know whether we're gonna have another pandemic or we're gonna have this, that, or the other thing. 
that could result in a big spurt of short term rentals. So, in my view, that supports the, the concept of planning planning ahead. Um, it did occur. It did occur to me that there could be even uh, economic things that happen on Seabrook that could result in something like that. And again, uh, I'm not at all predicting that that requirement, the island one, that is going to go away. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying a lot of comments want it to go away. And if it did, to me, it seems like that would result certainly in a spurt of, um, of short-term rentals. Um, also in terms of a cap, some, some people have talked about having a backstop or various words to use that don't cut down the current number, but make sure we don't go above a certain number. Um, uh, many of the com comments against the cap said we've never really increased that much, so what's so we don't need a cap because it's always been uh, between 20 and 25 percent. Uh, which then so that can be taken uh, either way, um, which is okay. So if we if there's a cap at say 26 percent, then you shouldn't. Nobody should be bothered by that because in the natural scheme of things, we'll never go above 25% anyway. So I just think that that argument that we see in a lot of these things is it can be used uh, both ways. Um, many, many comments were um, about preserving the life, the life cycle of people learning about Seabrook through rentals and coming here, loving the island, wanting to then maybe uh, get a, a, a place where they rent out and then ultimately moving here full time. That's really important. And I don't um, think that anyone on the uh, on this committee or I would venture to say on town council wants to upset that. Um, I think we've talked about that many times, but that's a really important thing, but I don't think anybody wants to upset it. But as I've said in uh, in the prior thing, in the prior meeting that, and then by the same token, it, the rentals are important, but the community is also important and and all the things that happen on this island supporting uh, so supported by the residents. So as with everything, in life, I think um, it's a matter of finding a balance. Um, next, uh, referring back to some of the things that we discussed here a few minutes ago, uh, some of the people who did comments, which were very interesting and very informative, have been people who have been coming here for 30 or 40 years. So they had histories, and they would relate the histories, uh, the history of, of Seabrook. One uh, person said that uh, at the High Hammock, um, High Hammock Villas, you'll notice that they are two door that there are two doors, and uh, and I had not noticed. And he explained the reason for the two doors is because um, they were built for rentals, basically for golf people to come to play golf. At, at the conference, and just come to conferences to play golf there. Conference center, and um, so I forget why they needed You could rent them as a one bedroom or a two. So, you could do individual units. Okay, so you could even take the two bedroom and make them in, into one room. That's if we had one door. So that's very, um, you know, that's very helpful to, to read about the history. It, and it again just gets back to what Deb and the rest of us were talking about a minute ago, which is um, reading all of these comments to me uh, does um, support uh, separation of, of just not doing a one size fit all, uh, fits all, of, of distinguishing between the different zoning districts. 
because when when we're talking about all these histories, you know, I, I, I didn't see anybody give a history about how all these, the lots, which if you go back and look at the maps from 30 or 40 years ago, I mean, all the lots were, were on there. They, most of them weren't developed, but they were on there. Um, there's no history that anybody related that said that those, that single family houses, for example, was going to be of the same nature of short-term rentals as High Hammock, which was specifically designed with two doors so that you could break up a two two bedroom into one bedroom for a short-term rental. So I think all of that just supports the fact that a one size fits all is not the appropriate way to go um, in, in terms of looking at this, that we do need to break up the zoning districts. Um, Enough, many people, again, as I've talked about in the past, said that there's no uh, problem. Uh, what's the problem? And if there is a problem, it's caused by the full time, um, uh, the full time residents who have their guests here and everything. And I, I, mean, I already talked about that. I'm not going to get in, into it again, but it, they do lead me to think that while we want to work with the club and learn more about the capacity and things like that, um, this committee is not going to be able to solve capacity problems at the club um, or, or support amenities. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, um, there, there are a lot of complexities there, and and the data is difficult because the data can be as accurate as the data is wrong. But to some extent, in terms of revenues at the club, it, there there might be more revenues from residents if there were fewer renters, there might be more revenue from renters if there were fewer residents. So you can look at the data, but it doesn't exactly tell you what to go to do in that regard. Um, one commenter said that um, full-time owners, and he was, he, he owned a short-term rental permit. Full-time renters do not use the amenities as much as renters. And a lot of people said, well, they do, because when their families come in, they use them more. I, my sense is that this gentleman uh, is, it has, it's much more sort of on point, because when people come to, if a rental, they, they come here for vacation, they come here to enjoy the place. The fa families are here, they're, they're not there to stay in every night, they're, they're there to do stuff. But in any event, the funny, the, the point I'm making is that he says that full-time renters do not use the amenities as much as renters do. And he's saying that is like, so that's a good thing about short-term renters is that they're, they're keeping the economy going by using uh, their dollars. And that's a totally legitimate viewpoint. It's just other people would say, no, that shows the opposite that we're, we're crowded out. So at and to me, what it sort of all boils down to is we're not going to, this committee or the town is not going to be able to resolve um, um, club capacity issues. It's, it's, we need to learn more about it, but we're just not going to be able to, I'm not going to proceed on the basis that what we're going to do here is going to solve problems at the, at the driving range of the club. Um, and the final, the final thing I would say in the general, and then I actually, there's a few specific things I want to mention. Um, there were, there were quite a few complaints about renter conduct that were specific and all of which simply showed me that to date, the, the data we've been getting uh, is just not very accurate. If I recall correctly, Heather said that apart from 
the garbage and um, parking, leaving the garbage cans out and the parking. There were like three reported incidents over the last three years. And before I was elected to town council, I'd heard of just from talking with friends and people I know, like three serious incidents of feeding the alligators. Um, in just by me, and I don't even know that many people. So um, I just I just don't think that uh, in the past. Sapoa has um, made it clear that you should call the gate and report things. I, my impression, just as somebody who lived here and who reads a lot of stuff, so, I mean, I try to read everything that, that comes out, whether it be the timelines, whether it be currents, whether it be um, uh, the, the clubs thing, is is that you were actually discouraged from doing it. I mean, it's a little bit like when you come in and it says call 911 if you have an emergency, which is absolutely true. If you're having a heart attack or whatever, just call 911. But nobody ever says, that sign will never say call the gate, call the gatehouse if there's a if there's a violation. You know, if there's a if there's a nuisance, call the gatehouse. And my impression was always, if you call the gatehouse, they're, they're just gonna tell you we're here to be at the gate. And I now I do think that a lot of that changed in October when they hired a new company. And that's, that's terrific, that's great. And we all know that from a traffic perspective, I think it's, it's, it's already having an effect. But in terms of looking back and saying, have there been problems with, um, behavioral problems and some of them were I'm sure caused by uh, owners or, or their guests but we you don't get a handle of it by looking at this past data because no one's really encouraged um, it to be reported and certainly in any way that's coordinated um, with the town or the club. I mean, so when everybody's doing, there was a number of people reported that um, in the evenings, the renters' kids. Now again, it, maybe they weren't renters' kids. Maybe they were kids of owners. I don't know. But people were out doing things on the golf course that were um, nuisance type things, and. Um, I do know that that's a separate number. That's a separate security thing because the club has insecurity and Sapoa doesn't respond to things that are happening on the golf course. So it's been a difficult process for people to know how to report these things. And I think that's something that we can make a major improvement on. But as we go forward, I, I think relying on past numbers is not, um, it's not that helpful. Um, okay, now there are, uh, uh, some things I just want to mention about specific um, comments that we got <clears throat> um, as opposed to sort of these themes that were covered in a bunch of different ones. Uh, one of uh, uh, somebody reported that um, when renters come in units that are pet friendly, that they would sometimes uh, leave, like they would come in, they would go to the beach, they would leave their dog in the in the unit. And as pet owners know, when a dog's in a strange place and just gets left there, dog's usually not very happy and barks a lot. So do, is there, how many people, I mean, how many roughly or Pet probably. I didn't think there's a lot of pet friendly units. Oh, my 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 oh,
the new security. With the new, yeah. With They're dog right parking, hand. yeah, dog parking. I've always had them. They, they they've always dressed. been, yeah, they've always addressed dog parking. Because that, um, to me, is two issues. One, it's noise for the neighbors, but it's also uh, stressful for the dog. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't, you know, the dog should be acclimated to the new environment before they just up and leave. So I, if a dog's barking there, that the dog, the dog's under stress yeah, too. I had a renter that left the back porch door open and the dog got out and came out and was st standing in front of the cottage barking. And it wanted to know where its owner was. It was all stressed down. And I got a hold of the the owner of the cottage, and they said, "Yeah, that's a renter." So I went in and got a dog biscuit because I didn't know if the dog would bite me or what would happen. And I coaxed them back into the cottage with the dog biscuit, and then shut the doors. But you know, that's an adventure when they leave the dogs unattended, right? Or leave them on screen porches. Yeah. yeah. And I think they get stressed me. out. Yeah. Right. So that I think is something that we need to uh, add to the list of, mm -hmm. of our conduct. Yeah, I put pet down, but I wasn't real specific. Yeah, that yeah. I was taking more of the people who don't leash their dogs and things like that. Yeah, but clearly barking. Well, the, the, the walking the dog off leash, except on the beach, is a Sapoa thing. Yeah, it's always been around. Yeah. But I, I'm we have a rule about that too. I, I did while we were sitting here. I just got a code violation from my to be stop someone on Bay with Trout their dog. Running around without a leash. So I was right. aware, I wasn't aware that we had that on yeah. the books until I just saw that come through. So. But that but that's like the, the owner was nearby. It's just he's letting okay. Yeah. So that's one thing, but I think we also need to supplement that that this uh, what what do you do when there's yeah, like my units have balconies, so I worry about people going to the beach and leaving the door open so the dog can go outside to the balcony. Well now they can bark and disturb all kinds of people. So. Yeah, we have it in our pet agreement that if your dog barks when you leave, I mean, not when somebody walks by and barks, but if the right. dog barks when you leave, someone has to stay there with the dog, right. or okay. you take the dog with you that you cannot leave. Well, that that's you know, yeah. But it still can happen. But it is written down. And what happens? And they have to sign it. What's the consequence, though? The consequence is if we get called and they get called, then. They get slapped on the wrist, I guess. I mean, yeah. Just, but I mean, we just, I mean, we do make them aware to remind them that you can't do that. Most pet owners, most of them, I don't want to go over John yeah, Lyman, most if, if they know you have to watch out for it, they'll, they, they're they pretty responsible. Well, if we write a new, if we help with a nuisance right. suggestion for owners, guests, renters, I'm not, I mean, it should be out of why. Yeah. It was interesting in the Coyote um, presentation. Uh, the one gentleman pointed out that you also don't want to let your dog off leash because they might chase a coyote or vice yep. versa. And my dog got attacked by a raccoon, believe it or not, that bit him in the face. So we might want to explain that it's a safety for the mm -hmm. dog or the pet, you know, to try and make sure they're on leash. Yeah, no, I mean, I, look, there are, there are very many reasons on Seabrook not to leave your Let dog unattended outside. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, our dog is very small, so we would and we would five seconds. Down yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, so the, the small dogs can, can be attacked in the air, the yes. ground, the snakes, or a little bit above ground from coyotes or alligators or any number of things. And, uh, but that is, and, and I'm not sure that everybody who comes here, at least for the first time, really is fully aware of that. But then, in addition, there's the noise element. So that's right. that's that's. And something. I think the noise yeah. element is the thing that more complaints are being made if there's no barking. Not necessarily through. They might be worried about the dog, but they're complaining because they don't want to listen to the barking. Right. Well, yeah. I completely understand. Yeah. No, I I understand. I mean, I've been in pet friendly hotels where the next door is barking. I mean. Uh, you can't sleep through that. I mean, mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, next one. Somebody uh, commented on my comment from the earlier meeting where I made reference to living in, uh, uh, to having a vacation home at the Jersey Shore and a referendum 
took place that only residents could partake in, uh, not anybody who owned short-term rentals like us. And he said, this ain't Jersey. So um, <laughs> to that person, I would say, okay, but um, Holly Beach is in South Carolina. He said, this ain't Jersey, we're in South Carolina. And I would say, Holly Beach is in South Carolina. All of these other places that have adopted short-term rental regulations are in South Carolina, as we spoke about. And um, there, it's because we're all in the United States. I mean, and in the United States, if we're talking about uh, town, um, what a town does, it's the, you get the vote in, in the town in which you're a full-time resident. So I will amend my remarks uh, to Folly Beach so that we can make sure that we're in South Carolina. And again, that's not to say that what Folly Beach did was a good thing, prudent thing, whatever. It's just to say that it was legal. Um, and uh, so a couple people said and it, it, that it was clear to them that you'd want a neighbor uh, that you knew rather than a rotating band of renters and um, and that that and we've talked about that sort of but it, it was sort of interesting to me to think of it that way that that uh, I think a lot of the people who are against any sort of caps including in the single family home areas, um, if so, they all live elsewhere. In in many many cases, I would think that they would live in single family home areas, whether it be Knoxville, Tennessee, or Atlanta, or Charlotte, or or Ohio, or whatever. And um, I I do would ask them um, to think what. Like if they were in their home in Knoxville and on either side of you, you had, instead of neighbors, you had um, people coming and going every week, whether you would think that would be something you'd want. And, may, and they may say, yeah, sure, that'd be great. Um, so again, we're, we're talking about Seabrook, where there's areas where there's traditionally been a high number of short-term rentals. And we're talking also about areas where uh, traditionally it's been single family homes with people who live here full time. So, um, but it, it, I thought that was a good way of, of saying uh, to do that thought process of in, in your full-time home, would you want, um, Short-term renters on either side of you. Um, okay, some person said that they can't believe that I shot down the idea of having a homeowners association uh, for Baywood, because that would deal with that problem. And they said, I said it was because of the expense, which I'm sure I mentioned, of hiring lawyers and doing all the rest. So let me make clear that within Seabrook, if you are in a existing association or regime, you could take a vote as as we've heard today on uh, short term rentals and put that in your covenants. But to set up a new regime on Seabrook, I will because I've looked into it, actually requires unanimity of your existing neighbors. And if not unanimity, then maybe one, like almost unanimity. So on a street that already has much short-term rentals, you, you're never, you're never going to get unanimity. So let me amend my remarks to say that the reason, first of all, people on Baywood can do whatever they want and try to do whatever they want, but um, I don't think it's they would ever get very far because to start something new requires unanimity and 
my opinion would be they would never get it. Um, and then finally, the uh, going along with what I just said, that uh, somebody said perhaps each regime can limit uh, short-term rentals. And as we've dis discussed today, the answer to that is yes, they can. So that's up, that's up to the existing regimes to do things. And that's obviously not something we're getting into, but that is uh, correct that individual regimes can take their own actions. Can I, I add a question along those lines? So if the town would designate caps, wouldn't that override whatever the regime did? Because you'd still have maybe a, a ceiling on the number of permits. So you possibly would hit the town permit ceiling before you hit the ceiling in the regime. Just, just to set out an example, like if I if we passed something at Summerwind that we wanted a 50% cap, mm -hmm. that half the cottages can be rentals and the other half not. But they may buy looking at our covenants and go, oh, okay. But if there aren't any permits available in town because there's a cap, you know what I mean? Then our covenant would take a lower authority than the town, wouldn't it? Wouldn't the town have the higher authority to limit the cap, limit the permit? So it's like, I believe it's like everything else. Um, we dealt a lot with this in the Architectural Review Committee. The town and Sapo may have different, or in this case, a, a subunit of Sapo, which would be a regime, may have different setbacks, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's always the most restrictive one. So okay. um, if, if the town says for this particular situation, there's a 15 foot setback um, and suppose a 20 foot setback, then it's the 20 foot setback that, that governs. But if it were the reverse, then the town should govern. If the town said 20 foot setback, then you'd have to do that. So it's always the most restrictive one. Okay. So in this case, if the if Summerwind said we're going to cap uh, short term rentals at fifty percent, and if we said we're going to cap for that zoning district at X number, mm -hmm. and you ran out of you ran you ran out of permits before you reached the fifty percent. Then yeah, then it yeah, wouldn't. The town it's would it's not like it's overridden. It's just you wouldn't. Right. You there wouldn't be any permits available. Yeah, there okay. wouldn't be permits. Because I had an owner ask me that question. I said I don't need it. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Well, and the other the flip side of that too is a regime the regime that, that are, is already like those five regimes that don't. Right. If we put a cap, could somebody come in and buy a place and say, look, the town has a cap on this, so I'm allowed. I mean, we have to put language in there. For both angles. For both angles, yeah. Because we have regimes that already have done that. Yeah, most of them don't allow short term rentals. They're all prohibited. So I, I mean, the five, think that's the, the five. 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 Yeah. Not yeah. most of them. Yeah. Yeah. Five, I meant of the five. Yeah. So to me, that's the most restrictive one. Mm -hmm. is the STRs are prohibited. But that's the so, regime, not SIPO and the town. That's all I'm saying. I but mean, if it's the most restrictive, then that means even if there's permits available, it would be the regime's. Short term rental yeah. prohib prohibited. I would think so, but I'm just saying if somebody took that, I don't know. We, I think we need to have that in. Well, I, it, yeah, I mean, that should, that should be clear whether it needs to be clear in the ordinance or it's already clear from other things. But that that is that needs to be clear to people that if we if there were a cap of X for that zoning district with the cluster of homes and there's um, there's room to grow. There, you, if somebody came in and bought something in one of those regimes or associations, that they could come in and say, "Hey, there's still 50 uh, permits available from the town in this." That does not override right their covenant, their covenant. and they should know that. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> 
real estate agent would make sure they knew that. But yeah, so I so I don't so your your point is very good. They should know it, whether that needs to be the ordinance. I think it needs to be because you have off island realtors that come in and don't tell people anything. Yeah, there, there's yes, if the idea is that they are interested in renting and they see and they inquire of the town and the, and the town says, yep, there's still there's still permits we can give. And they think that that's going to override the regime. That's that's a, a very serious mistake that they would be making. So don't know what to do with that yet, but absolutely, the the rule is always like I said, it's the, the most restrictive thing. So mm -hmm. um, it's it, if if the association has something more restrictive, that that would that would apply to them. As as we get into the minutia of drafting whatever the ordinance ends up being um that's one thing we as staff will probably recommend um is so right now if somebody wants to come in and get a permit they have to give us a copy of the poa approval and if it's in a regime or a social separate association a copy of the approval from that association um, as more regimes are considering and possibly adding additional restrictions um, that's something that I think we probably want to put into our permitting process is when the application is submitted um, for a short-term rental permit, it should be accompanied by uh, a letter or some sort of approval um, from the regime or association saying that this property can be rented um, under their covenants and restrictions. Um, we don't ask for that currently. I think we need to make sure that we follow up the real estate company too, that when people come in here to purchase, and I don't know that I brought it with me, but I got a spreadsheet from the real estate company on what they're tracking on the regimes and associations to tell potential buyers. And I don't remember anything about any caps on these neighborhoods. So I, I'm gonna go back and, and see like they're saying, is the insurance included, not, you know, they have all these, and what the assessment is, it quarterly, monthly, whatever. I almost think they need to make sure that at least our own real estate company is accurately communicating to these people because I wouldn't want a new buyer to come in and buy something thinking they're going to get a rental permit and get a big surprise. Right, because I had an off a person call me and they were working with an off-island realtor and they said, we're looking at buying in Marsh Point. And I said, and they, could you tell me the rental capacity? And I said, well, you can't in Marsh Point. It has to be 30 days or longer. And they said, no, 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 no. I go, Yes, that's the rule. That's their regime rule. I said, unless it's changed, but you're right. But that's what I'm saying. The off, they're the most dangerous. They're the most dangerous. Yeah, no, that's extremely important. The last thing we want somebody to do is come in under a mis assumption. So that is something that we, um, if we go that route, that we will have to make sure that everybody understands it. Uh, one thing I missed, the fi my final uh, comment, uh, again, just trying to respond to people, is one uh, commenter did uh, suggest that we table what we do um, because the South Carolina legislature is uh, looking at whether to restrict municipalities from regulating short-term rentals. And my response to that is that um, that bill has been proposed every year for the past several years. Um, the Municipalities Association opposes it, um, which I guess is neither here nor there. It's just that the bill has been proposed for several years and it hasn't been enacted. Um, if uh, if it if it ever is enacted, obviously we will abide by it. But until then, the fact that it's proposed every term in the legislature does not mean that we. Um, should not act because of that. So um, any other comments? Okay, so let's talk for just a minute. Uh, we have one more uh, session scheduled and I think that next week, as I mentioned, we should talk about um, what uh, conduct we want to propose to be regulated. Um, trash, parking, et cetera. 
And um, we're, uh, as, as I've said before, the good news is we're not a drafting committee, so we're just here to um, propose substantive points, not, not to actually do the drafting. Um, so that will keep us half time next week, and um, that will be the agenda for that, unless anybody else has anything to put on the agenda for next week. Okay. So then the question is what um, scheduling wise after that? So we have, um, uh, we're, I've heard from a few people and not surprisingly, we're getting a little bit into the spring travel season. Um, next week is April 3rd. We don't have anything scheduled. We after do that. one o'clock. We, we got next yeah, Wednesday. Third scheduled. Yes, April third at one o'clock. Um, I will add if but, you want, as we're getting into renewal seasons, um, for business licenses and short-term rentals for 2024, 2025. If you would like, we can bring in some members of staff as an as call basis. They won't be able to sit through the sure. meeting entirely, and we're also getting into. Um, Different meeting dates, so that's why I've got the council chamber's calendar pulled up. So if we Great. Mondays look relatively clear compared to Wednesday, Wednesdays of what we've historically been doing, if the meetings are going to run a little bit longer. Okay. So out. thank you. So yes, I meant that we are that, that our final meeting is is Wednesday, um, April third, and I think for that meeting, since we'll be discussing these sorts of things, at least Tyler and Beth, if. if if you two could be here, um, because we'll be discussing the sort of things that will impact on enforcement. Um, so that's good. Sure. Tied up. Should be able to, unless I am still working on the comp plan. Because okay. In, well, we're a week on, on, oh, on. Okay. Right in the midst of that, right? Now yeah. Well. So you can only um, do what you can do, but that, so next week, that may be a Zoom. Yeah. Okay. So we that's in the attic, um, working okay. and doing this simultaneously. Okay. So if you can, great. If not, we, we understand. But that's what we'll be working on, and so that would be helpful uh, for that. Okay. So after that, uh, so Catherine, were you saying that you would recommend moving it to a different day of the week because of other meetings that are going to be taking place? Yes. And that would be Mondays. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mondays or Friday. Uh, or Mondays generally, we'll, we'll get in just a second into vacations, but are Mondays generally good for this panel? For me, better than Friday. Okay, yeah, I prefer Monday with Friday. Okay, so we'll switch to Mondays now. Um, Deb, I know you had said you're going to be on vacation. Uh, well, Monday works better for me, but I'm going Monday, April 15th. Yeah, I might miss one or two. It just depends how far right. I have to go. And that's that's going to be inevitable. Um, and to Nancy's comment, I'm going to be gone that week as well. Um, which I think is a fairly high travel week. Uh, are are people when when did you say you're going to be? I'm going to be going the 10th to the 15th and then the 29th of April to May 7th but Mondays were pretty well if we did May. Monday April 8th I know it's it's soon after um mm -hmm. but but we're going to be getting the heat of things uh, pretty quickly so um and then we could and then I think we'd have a break because that next week um, the 15th is a bad day. Uh, is mm -hmm. it well? Oh, Monday is tax day. Is that what you're? No, I just said it sounds several of you've mentioned the 15th that you're going to be gone, so it sounds like that week is bad. Well, yes, yeah, so, so Monday, April 8th, will do skip the 15th. What time would be best for everyone? 
Uh, Ollie wants us to start at eight o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I told him I thought he meant eight o'clock in the evening, which would be fine for me. But apparently, uh, no. we'll we'll need to compromise more. Is it? Uh, do we have? Are there like ten o'clock? Is that free generally? Yes. Um, the only thing we have after like at eight thirty, we just have a staff meeting, but then it's usually done by ten o'clock, and then we have nothing scheduled for the entire day. So you can either do it at ten. 11, 1. Okay, so how about, how about 10 o'clock? Okay, on the 8th? Yeah. Okay. Um, Tracy, just weigh in whenever you, if you need to say anything. Um, okay, let's skip the 15th. Uh, how about the uh, well, I'm not available the 22nd because I won't be driving back. That's too big a gap. Um, now, at the 19th, Friday the 19th. No, well, you've gone. Oh, that's right, because you're gone. Maybe. So I think there are. If we pick up again April 29th, um, are people generally around for the May time period? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. So why don't we do that? Because um, we're going to have two meetings, the one next week and then followed soon after by the Monday meeting. And uh, then why don't we just schedule them and... May with the idea that we will not um, have them if we don't need them. So you're saying April 29th? Yeah, April 29th. Uh, well, and then you probably should throw out May 27th because it's Memorial Day. I think. Yeah. We definitely yeah. are not going to. Yes, we're not going to. Yeah, but you can go up to the 20th and give you three more weeks. Yeah, so that's. That's a pretty good. So a April 29th. What are we saying? 10 o'clock again? Yes. I'll be zooming in again. Okay. Then five, six. Yes. Um, Monday, May 6th. Monday, May 13th. Monday, May 20th. And that is in addition to next week's we say the meeting. That's five meetings. Three, four, eight, or six. So that's five meetings. Seven. Yeah, I mean, including next week. Okay. Five the, meetings. Right. That's that's six oh, meetings. Um, I, that's more than five. I'm, one, two, three, three, four, five. That's seven meetings. I got six. Okay, I, I got six. six. So we're skipping two weeks six. in there. Six. One, two, three. Next week. April, 20th, the 13th, the 6th, the 29th, the 8th, and the 3rd. Right. That's six. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So the meeting dates again for everybody are April 3rd at 1 o'clock, back here in Council Chambers, April 8th at 10 a.m. here. April 29th at 10 a.m. May 6th at 10 a.m. May 13th at 10 a.m. and May 20th at 10 a.m. Excellent. Well, thank you all. And also, for example, Ted, but any others who learn uh, information uh, in their respective endeavors, please send that to Catherine so she can circulate it to us. And um, we can all read it for next meeting. Um, anything else? Okay, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, second. Hey, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it.